Good evening. Um, my name is Bill Twight. I'm the council president for the City Council of Northampton. This is, we are convening a special council meeting on the draft city charter that has been presented to us after a long vetting process through the uh, special committee that was established for charter review and then went to a draft committee and created a 43-page document that uh, is a significant change, not a significant change in line with uh, in the Constitution, but it is a, a much needed change in a document that is over, almost 130 years old. Um, this is an informal meeting. Actually, I should also notify everyone, this, this meeting is being recorded by Northampton Community Television and is, is available as a public document. Um, this is an informal session of the council that no votes will be taken tonight. The uh, purpose of this is to have us develop a better sense of what amendments, if any, should be made to the proposed draft. And we're it's a free flowing conversation. What I'm going to do is invite uh, the public to speak, the public session, where the public can speak to the point of the charter, please. Stand that there will be no limit on your time, but please keep in mind there might be other people wanting to speak. Uh, after the public comment session, uh, councilors are free to recognize uh, members of the public if they have any questions or they seek their advice or comments. I see that Tom Moran is here, <laughs> the sole, the sole uh, representative of the draft committee right now. Um, so the, but you'll have to be recognized. And I ask that everyone um, only speak when recognized, and that's also true of us, so that we each have a fair term, we don't get in uh, too many back and forths. The, the purpose of this is, as I said, is to help us get a sense of what we are going to discuss in formal session of the council, which is this draft charter. Now, I'll give you the quick timeline. The, as I said, it's gone from uh, 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 the charter review, and the charter review committee recommended the establishment of a draft committee, which was an appointed committee of citizens who uh, worked on this document for a long time, which I'm sure Tom Miranda and Mary can attest to. And there's lots of documentation relative to that. They made their formal presentation, not the last council meeting, but two council meetings ago. Uh, the next stage is we vote on it on the council floor on two readings, which means it occurs over the course of two meetings. And if it passes as amended or as it stands, it will go on to uh, the state legislature, where they will review and approve, and then send it on to the governor's office, who will review and approve, hopefully, and then go to the Secretary of State, be drafted as a ballot question, sent back to Wendy Maza. The city clerk will inform the public that this will be available at, hopefully, the November election that comes now. And that the public, once again, has an opportunity to weigh in and vote uh, their pleasure on this on this document that we're discussing today. So we'll start with um, the the public session right now. I only have uh, one person signed up, and that's Adam Cohen. And Adam, you're welcome to come up and share. And Barry, I'm pretty sure you're interested in speaking. With you. So uh, we'll start with Adam Cohen. And, and sorry, Adam, uh, could you please identify yourself and, and address also for the purpose of that? My name is Adam Cohen. I live at 134 North Street in Northampton. I would like to encourage you to consider adding provisions for free petitions and recall petitions to the proposed charter. Free petitions provide an orderly mechanism for citizens to place an item on the agenda of the city council or the school committee. It doesn't require any particular action or necessarily bog officials down in lengthy discussions. The City of Methuen Charter provides for free petitions and requires them to carry signatures of 150 voters. That's the same standard as our proposed charter requires for nominations for mayor. Only one hearing need be held on a particular subject per year. I believe these provisions will reduce the possibility of citizens abusing the process to impede the city's work. And of course, our charter can be revised in later years if things prove otherwise. If City Hall would like the people to extend it more trust, I believe City Hall should extend some trust to the people in this wise and allow for free petitions. Methuen also provides for recall petitions. Here the bar is quite high. To trigger a recall election, 
at least half the number of those who voted in the preceding local election must sign the petition. Our proposed charter calls for extending the term of the mayor to four years. Providing for recall petitions balances this by offering voters a way out in cases of extreme dissatisfaction. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Please identify yourself in here. My name is Barry Roth. I live here in Florence. And I'm calling to speak about the charter review. Um, I think the charter review is, uh, as was spoken by David Stevens, who was in charge of it, tended to focus on updating the terminology and uh, simplifying the charter, but it didn't address a fundamental issue. Uh, <clears throat> they didn't set out to address a fundamental issue, and that is for people who live in Northampton, the fact that a lot of people feel uh, cut off from their government as if their voice hasn't, isn't being heard. And I can cite a specific instance in which right here in this uh, neighborhood in Florence, a, a pillar of the community uh, chose to leave the community, even though he loved the community, because uh, he felt that it, there's no point in coming to speaking at council meetings, because whatever they had to say wasn't being recorded. Or, or, or heard. It was verbally heard, but it wasn't really listened to. Um, that has been my experience as well on, on issues in which I have been seriously involved. It was just like, you're invisible. You come, you speak before the city council, that's it. Um, it's, it's just like a token. Uh, excuse me, I, I kind of ran here. <laughs> um, and there's one other thing. A lot of people take credit for the fact that uh, Northampton is a great place to live. And for that matter, uh, a lot of people in government in general take, take a lot of credit for the quality of life that we experience here in America. But I'm not sure that that is attributable uh, entirely to the success of government. From my perspective, when I was in the fifth grade and we looked into the future, uh, we saw three-day work weeks, and the question was, what we could, were we going to be doing with all our time? What we didn't see was the breakup of the family, the, um, the increase in, in poor and poverty, the, uh, the extinction of species after species, the, the, just the destruction of the environment within our community, and within the country as a whole. Um, and I attribute that to a failure to have adequate uh, discourse. It's like winner take all. And I think the way the government uh, right here in Northampton right now works is some people have their voice heard, but there isn't a genuine discussion very often. I know people can, if they're really furious, if there's enough of them, a, a petition can be taken up. But on a day-to-day -day practical basis, there is a failure to listen to the other side. That's what's going on in the federal government right now, um, where it's, it, 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 there's a lack of communication. And I'd like to see put into the charter something that would facilitate greater communication and let so everybody know that if they come and they speak before the city council or if they submit material, that it will be heard. And I, I, I'd like to break that out a little, a little bit further. <clears throat> um, the fact of the matter is that, in reality, the amount of information on any given subject that comes up before the city council for a vote is huge. And I think, personally, I, I read a great deal. I'm a fast reader. But it is impossible to keep up with the number of subjects that you are expected to keep up with. So therefore, it's important that uh, the information be available to you before you have your meetings to digest. That, that includes not only the pro, pro views, but also the opposing views.
so the way, so so I've, I've made two points here. One, you sh that uh, you need to get opposing views, and I've noted that information that you primarily rely upon is on the committees. The committees are, are which do are where much of your information that you draw on to make your decisions comes from, in my experience. An another problem that's uh, endemic to to a lot of uh, commentators in the New York Times have uh, talked about the disappearance of leadership in the country. And uh, I think some of that's attributable to the fact that we have this mass media now where uh, anything you say is immediately spread around and it's very easy to be ostracized for, uh, on a given position. And if you're running for election or if you're just sub subject at all to, uh, to pressure from anyone, then uh, it's a new world. The country has changed a great deal in 120 years. I know that um, Gene Tacey, Council Tacey, uh, Council Tacey spoke up on uh, the CPA and uh, he, he asked for a discussion of it. And for simply asking for a discussion of it, uh, he was really, uh, took a lot of heat. I'm not talking, he didn't take a position, he asked for a discussion. And I can think of things that I would be afraid to come before the committee to speak of for fear of social ostracism. I've seen votes taken that, that are really just political correctness going, going crazy, from my perspective. And um, I'm sure, if you, uh, depending on the town, your views, you will experience that elsewhere. Um, there's also within, and again, the reason I'm talking about this is because it's, very, it's critical that government hear all sides with respect if there's going to be genuine resolutions. And what's happening in society as a whole right now is there's so many media outlets, people li listen to the station that just reinforces their views. They never hear the other side. So you've got Fox on one hand, you've got MSNBC on the other hand, and sometimes uh, at some of the meetings, nothing personal, don't take it too seriously, but it's you kind of get this MSNBC sense uh, within, within North Ham Northampton. And if you lived in another community, you get the Fox sense, but it's, it's people reinforcing their views, not, not hearing. It needs, it needs to be broken. People need to have a chance to hear each other. So we're going forward, uh, we're going forward. The changes that are made to this charter right now are going to carry us probably another hundred years, uh, possibly. And it, for all we know, uh, before it's done, we're going to have uh, computers making decisions for us. <coughs> and uh, when that happens, uh, you're going to be sure you're going to want to be heard when you speak up. Um, and that's a real possibility, um, being, in, being in the computer field. So, um, so basically, I... I Got a lot of good feedback uh, from my original ideas from the Charter Review Committee, and they uh, they made valid suggestions and raised valid questions. and And based upon the things that they said and they suggested, I reworded what I was originally asking for to be included as part of the charter. And I, I suppose, for the record, I will read it, and I will say that. Um, I've spoken to people who are experts on the on the charter, and they felt it was it was it was fair. And the other thing is, um, when the city council re uh, this is to be included under rules and procedures, when the city council relies on a formal recommendation for its voting, it should accept an opposing statement for review prior to its vote. When, when, and if a differing position exists. The composition shall state in writing the specific reasons for such disapproval. The City Council shall enter the objections as part of the record in the same manner they entered the recommendations prior to voting. It's really, I don't really see any reason to object to it. The mechanizations of it, that's for you guys to come up with a, 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 work, a, a maximum workable solution. But I, I, uh, it's really needed. I think it would do a great thing. Uh, to help break some of the class barriers, the political barriers, and so on. So I, 
and from, uh, I really hope that you will include this. And uh, for me, it's all about um, the environment. At the end of the day, the only ones who never really get hurt are all the living creatures that we displace. They have zero say. And, and there's no ins so if somebody speaks out for them, it's very hard to be heard. If a realtor wants to, to build up and there's always going to be money in, build, in, in clearing forests, um, the only way it's going to be get, get on the record to be heard is something like this. And, and that's it for me, but I'm sure each of you will find yourself in a minority position and have valid reasons for feeling the way you do. And each of you deserves to have your opinion put on the record. Thanks, Eric. Is there anyone else interested in uh, speaking to, speaking up about this? Uh, we, uh, good to see you. We're, um, I'm probably going to be calling on you at some point, you folks in the audience, because of the you've already associated with the, the arc of this charter at some point, so as we have hack our way through this. Um, and now, now we're open for our own discussion. And, and I, I can remind folks who just came in that um, public comment period is still open right now. If you're interested, we can ref we left it open that we can refer to you at the counselor's pleasure if they want to ask you a question or ask your opinion. And if you have an opinion to offer and it seems to remain, I'm not going to discourage you from doing that, but principally we want to keep the conversation with them amongst ourselves on point. I don't want to get lost in the weeds here because we do have a short timeline. So, um, what's the council's pleasure here? We can. Um, I'm going to presume that everyone's read the summary as it was presented, and, uh, and, and probably much of the language, if not all, of the uh, 42, 43 pages of uh, 47 pages of the chart. Um, how do you want to break this down? What's do you want to see? Are there, well, let me ask first, are there anything that really sticks out that somebody that, that, that feel needs to be addressed pronto? Right. Yes. Um, we had two people speak, we need to review the session. Mm -hmm. So, if we need to have a lot of knowledge of what they were talking about. We can, absolutely. We can talk about the issues that Adam brought up and Barry brought up if you want. Um, and in fact, I think it's all appropriate. Uh, so, are there any other, are there any other things in this document that have uh, red, that's red flag for something? Oh, yes. Okay, Jean. Well, we'll, we'll start, probably start right with Mary and what she was going to start with. Okay. And go through. What do you, what do you want to do page by page? Just well, really I, I think if we went page by page, we have we have to be out of this room by nine. Oh, so, but but the, um, the hope was is that the, the red flag stuff, let's talk about the red flag stuff. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to get a sense of the temperature of the room. So. Well, I, I would propose that we go that, that we go issue by issue. In other words, we, we can take the two speakers' thoughts and right. respond to that. And then, as opposed to necessarily being page bound, I, I would suggest that we just be issue bound, right. meaning where's your issue and talk about your issue. Okay. Well, you, you want to, well, let's, uh, so does everyone agree with that? Yeah. Well, let's break it out first in order of the way it was presented. Adam Cohen has presented uh, a request for the public's right to petition to put items on the agenda. It was addressed by the uh, Charter Review Committee. Their recommendation was. I'd like to recognize Mr. Cohen. Sure. I recognize him. Do you have a question? Yeah, Mr. Cohen, um, you said that uh, under the free petition, there were 150 signatures that were required, and what specifically was the, it's under the city of, what's it? Methuen. And what was the, um, what was the free petition used for? Could you repeat that? The free petition is a way for citizens to, it puts a subject on the agenda of the city council or the school committee. Um, it doesn't direct them, to, doesn't require them to take a specific action, but it's, it's a way to get a particular subject discussed. Um, Methuen picked 150 citizens. Um, 
you, know, you of course are free to pick whatever number seems appropriate to you. Um, it struck me as a fairly significant bar to avoid trivial petitions, clogging agendas. Um, so it's, it's a pretty bare bones petition mechanism. Did, did yeah, that clarify? Follow up, yeah. <laughs> did you say that you could only have one a year? Is that oh, just Methuen said if, if you do free petition on a subject, you can't free petition it again until a year has passed. So that was a safeguard they put in there so that people couldn't just keep doing it and clogging things up. And that would be the clerk that would make the would say, oh no, this is this petition's too similar to that one to be any I, different. I would assume I have the language, I also submitted it to Mary if you want to see specifically how they wrote it. Same thing. I'm curious to hear what the draft came. The draft uh, committee said the citizen initiative provides a means for citizens to try and enact ordinances that the city council or school committee will not go to the law. Referendum provides redress for citizens who wish to repeal an ordinance the city council has approved or a decision of the school committee. Our proposals modernize and clarify these procedures. We recommend it against the adoption of the so-called free petition provision as it carries the possibility of excessive disruption in local city business. We recommend against the adoption of a recall measure as it cannot provide sufficient standards for determining incompetence and result in an endless cycle of elections and recalls and undermine citizens' confidence in the election. The recall, I don't believe Adam was, you weren't asking for a recall petition, which was one of the other petition questions. No, I, I did. A recall yeah. of, of a particular petition. Yeah. So that was, that, was the, that was in the executive summary. Um, we do have a couple of members here from um, the draft committee, if you want them to speak to that. Getting an interest in talking to them. Well, so, Todd, do you have some? If you do, uh, come to the microphone, please, and, and identify yourself and your address. Um, Todd Thompson, 76 Massasoit Street. If, I, if I'm correct, our thinking about the free petition was as Adam stated, it puts an item on the agenda. Um, if an item is so controversial that the city council doesn't want to put it on, a, on the agenda itself, we felt that what's, what purpose would the free petition really serve if all a petitioner really has to do is approach a counselor or two, get their support, and put it on the agenda. Um, we felt that if, if, if someone couldn't gain the support of one or two counselors to drive it onto the agenda, that it really wasn't that valuable. It didn't serve a real important purpose. Um, that's my take, that's my understanding of it. Um, Tom's here, he might be able to clarify, but just so you understand our thinking about leaving the free petition off of this proposed chart. Thanks. Tom, do you want to speak? Sure. My name is Tom Miranda, and I was a member of the, uh, the chairman committee. The, uh, what Tata said is correct. That was a consensus that was reached by the, uh, by the committee. The, there was uh, a lot, of, in my mind, there was a lot of discussion about the access of citizens to uh, government, uh, both addressed by what Adam said and by what Barry said. And, there was a reluctant, I thought that it was articulately presented by a number of people uh, with regard to the free petition. And uh, I think that uh, there was a gradient in terms of how receptive uh, some of us were and how receptive and not receptive others of us were. The, uh, we were looking, as Todd said, that it would possibly result in an endless barrage of uh, people coming before the uh, the council with uh, with questions or issues, and I don't think that uh, we were ready to uh, make that recommendation. Uh, but it it goes to a much broader concern in my mind uh, of citizen access, citizen ability to feel that they can participate in uh, in local government, and I think that it's something that. Uh, Whichever way you go on it, you should, you should think it through. You, you're members of the council, you deal with this on a regular basis, you have to anticipate what 
uh, the uh, free petition would result in. The, the recall is a, is a little bit different issue, and, and Barry's point, I think, is, is very well taken, a way that uh, minority uh, or opposing viewpoints can be somehow put on, on the record. I just, I'm sorry, I thought the free petition, maybe I don't get it, but what's the difference between the free petition and the initiative petition as far as content, not as far as format? The initiative petition is a much greater burden on people that want to get an issue before the council. I right. think I understand that. No, okay. I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about format as in how it comes before the council. I'm talking about content. I don't think there's that. That was our that was a consensus on the committee that uh, the you initiative. Can put, you can put an order, ordinance, or resolution in front of the council using initiative or free. Yes, but I, I sense that the free petition was not as uh, as detailed as an ordinance. It could be a, an issue with regard to uh, taking a stance on some broader political uh, issue that's going on in the country, uh, as opposed to something that would specifically affect the city of Northampton. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just I wanted that clarification. If you wanted to, speak. nope, that's okay. Todd, did you want to? Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify that. My understanding, or our understanding, is a free petition, um, all it accomplishes is that it places an issue on the agenda. If you, it goes on the agenda, you could talk about it, you don't have to vote on it, you could go away, and that's it. That's the free petition. An initiative is a more drawn out process um, that requires you to ultimately vote. If you vote it down, then the petitioners have the option to raise more signatures and put it on the ballot. So it's a, it's the start of a process. You can read through the charter and get the details of how that's laid out. But if you have any questions about the difference, uh, talk to um, Steve, the consultant. He can um, he can help clarify. But but our understanding, the free petition just gets it on the agenda. That's it. You could ignore it once it's on the agenda, but it places it on your agenda. Is that? There is no assurance once the free petition allows it, gets it on the council agenda, that it would ever be recognized <coughs> and voted on. Well, our understanding from, from Stephen is that it could just be referred to uh, the committee. The committee, exactly, and to die, exactly. And so that it wasn't that powerful. Um, and if it, was a, if it was a valuable issue that had the support of some members, then you could put it on the agenda to be taken seriously. But it, 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 it's not a potent weapon um, to pass an ordinance in that sense. It's just a way to raise an issue in front of the council. The distinctions we're making are essentially thresholds. Uh, uh, the thresholds of getting something before the council. And the thing that I'm trying to think of an example, an applicable example that may have occurred in the time in recent history, past history, where I think there was a vote about the war in Iraq that well, the council the took up, but say there was a vote about you know the war in Afghanistan. Well, there was. Okay. Well, well take take another like, issue. There were resolutions um, to that effect. Take the issue about the uh, the funding of um, Planned Parenthood. Someone wanted to get that yeah. on the agenda. Council members thought this doesn't really belong on our agenda. Right. They get their votes, they put it on the agenda. You have to take it up, whatever that means. Um, that's the free petition, at least my understanding. <laughs> so my thoughts on this issue is that it really is, thank you, that's sure. all very thank helpful you. for everybody, is that it, it really boils down to whether or not we want to incorporate this as an organizing tool for citizens in relation to city council, because that's, that's what it seems to me to be. It's an organizing tool. It's, it's saying, I mean, and to me, the, I, I am, my inclination um, is that structural, uh, that, that there are other organizing tools that exist um, as a matter of our, you know, in our community that where we don't, that I actually don't think this is meaningful in view of the fact that the council, if the council is determined not to listen to its constituents, it could refer to committee and it would be, it wouldn't be relevant. Um, and that they're, and, and yet, but of course that's not going to be the case. Just like, and we've seen these, we've seen organizing in the community get the landfill resolution happening, get the war in Iraq resolution happening, get the start time attention on the school. I mean, you know, the community organizes. We've got a great community that makes sure it gets heard. And to me, the issue is making sure we have the vehicles to be heard. And I think that they exist in many medium where this, to me, doesn't feel uh, a, a mean, a, like a meaningful one, actually, even though I am a tremendous supporter of organizing tools. I just don't think that this is 
It's the same. How, how about the, the recall petition? How long is sent to it, the recall petition? The, um, the recall uh, petition, I, if you have a four-year term of the mayor, I think maybe that might be something uh, that we could think about. But I don't think you're here. For a two-year two, two mayoral, mayoral term, I, I think a recall is uh, it's extraneous. It's just, uh, I, I, I just don't believe in it. I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessary. If you had a four-year term, well, we're debating for your time. Yeah, well, it's, I know. I was trying not to, not to mix the two, but it was one of the issues that I had. Yeah, they're all relevant. Um, so I, I would opt for a recall petition if we had put a four-year mayoral term in, but I wouldn't if it was a two-year term. If I, if I may, I believe, and you guys will correct me if I'm wrong, the draft committee discussed this as a possibility, too. This is one of the triggers from the discussion of the four-year term, the, uh, but the argument that would also lend itself to the argument of keeping councils at two years, and that offering is the checks and balance of the council. You have a uh, mayor gone rogue, as it were, but the voters have an opportunity to vote in a council that would serve as counterpoint to checks and balances, uh, uh, that kind of thing. The, arg the argument against the recall was the, the potential BP and then now I'm projecting, but the, our arguing for uh, the recall actually what it does is it creates a tenuous position for any city seated mayor to move on an agenda that still has to run through the process to be vetted by the council and, um, and can be used for essentially political, uh, uh, political cudgels. And it, and it, is, it's, it's, it has a potential for abuse. Although, as we've seen, I mean, in Wisconsin, clearly, they employ it, so. Sure. Can I, can I recognize Mr. Cohen again? Yeah, uh, I recognize everybody. <laughs> to get, to take us through the recall provision that mm -hmm. uh, Thune uses, I think that, uh, to your point, Councilor Dwight, uh, to, to try to wield 50% of the voters as a cudgel, I think is uh, pretty special. Uh, but it, you know, it seems like a pretty high threshold. Number two, um, I understand the point, but I don't think it's a very good one. That if I'm ticked off at you, I take it out on Jesse. So why would we, you know, why have a four-year mayor and then vote out all the councils? You could instead vote out the mayor. <laughs> uh, so could you just describe the feeling sure. how that works? Uh, sure. So I have here, this is a part of the Methuen's Home Rule Charter. Uh, I could, do you want me to read you the whole fat paragraph about the... No, just the salient elements. Yes. Okay. Um, and fundamentally, it says, the recall petition shall be returned and filed with city clerk within 60 days after the filing of the affidavit. Shall have been signed by at least 50% of the number of voters of the city who have voted in the last preceding local election. Or in the case of a district councilman of the district who shall add their signatures to street and number if any of their residences. And I watched some of the charter drafting committee meetings, and I was concerned that some members of the committee didn't appreciate um, the effort and commitment involved in the part of citizens to, to do anything like this. I, I think at the local level that it would be extremely rare you'd ever see a serious recall petition effort mounted. Um, this is, I look at this, this is a safety valve in case something unimaginably bad is happening, you know, maybe once a century or something. I, I just can't imagine that people are really going to abusively do recall petitions. They're, they're busy. They have other things to do. This is a huge amount of effort. Um, so I think, as, as Gene said, if you go with four-year terms for a mayor, that's the particular piece I'm most concerned about. I feel more comfortable extending the mayor's term if you add this safety valve in case something hard to imagine goes wrong. And that's all. Thank you, and, and I concur. Um, the council, the majority of the council wishes to take a recommendation for the term. I would probably hard to also add to the public. Uh, anyone from the uh, advisory committee care to comment on, on why they did 
not recommend recall petition. Because I you don't rely on me to, to translate for you because that would There were some at, there were some members of the uh, committee that were very much opposed to a recall. They thought it was very disruptive. I, I think that there were other members that were lukewarm on the issue uh, either way and deferred to those that were more set in their opinions and, and they, were very, they were very vocal about it. That's, that was my take. So was, the concern was disruption. Disruption in uh, politics uh, in, the, in the city and targeting uh, the, an individual because, uh, because of his uh, or her um, stance on a particular issue or lifestyle or something like that. Uh, yeah. Was, was, the, was the specific issue that Adam is bringing up, the 15%, was that part of it or was it just a general discussion about a recall? No, it, it actually, um, to sort of back up a bit, um, I initially sort of came at this the same way Adam is coming at it, um, which is to say if we're going to extend the term of the mayor four years or suggest that, then there needs to be some safety valve on that. Um, I think the thresholds we talked about to put it on the ballot were more around the 25 percent, 20 to 30 percent um, initially proposed by, by Stephen McGoldrick. Um, uh, as Tom said, there were some people who were sort of stridently opposed to this and they articulated those views uh, quite well. Um, I ended up um, sort of coming around to the view that um, elections are a way to, to sort of uh, uh, deal with with these issues, and um, uh, they raise the the historical situations in California, where uh, Governor Schwarzenegger came in after a recall of the governor, um, and what you have going on in Wisconsin. So that's on both sides of the political spectrum. That it's quite disruptive. Um, Stephen McGoldrick said that it can poison sort of the atmosphere in a community when you have the veiled threat of a recall hanging out there. And I think you can you see that in Wisconsin. You saw that in California. And we just, we didn't see a compelling need, um, given that there are other checks and balances in the system. So, that, at least that was my take. And Bill, did you have any? Yeah, one, one more add there. Uh, Bill Scher, uh, I was on the Charter Review Committee uh, as well, uh, Charter Drafting Committee, excuse me. Um, just put a fine point on what, what's meant by disruption. Because, you know, democracy is not disruption. <laughs> yeah, that, that itself is not an argument to say that it shouldn't be done. The concern is, should uh, a minority uh, be able to force continued disruptions? You know, someone's always going to lose in an election. Uh, and what threshold can you make for a recall? To, to, to make the threshold 50% is untenable. You know, no one's ever going to get 50% of signatures ahead of time of an election. It has to be a minority threshold. But then, a disgruntled minority could gear up for a recall election on day one. Even if you say, well, it'll take it, like in Wisconsin, for example, it takes a year before you could have the recall, but folks were organizing for it ahead of time. Uh, and you could have a disgruntled minority force the city into election after election, make it impossible for uh, elected <laughs> officials to make decisions and govern because they have to constantly campaign. When, as Todd and, and Thomas were saying, there, there are other checks here. Uh, if, you, if, the, if you're going to stick with a four-year term for mayor, uh, then you have the two-year mark, a chance to throw out the entire city council if you want to and say, hey, you're going off the wrong track. Uh, so the, the public's always going to have a say uh, every two years. You don't want to make it so it's impossible for those who are elected by a majority to have a chance to actually govern and make decisions so that, that, could, that the public can under judgment on. Um, is, is was also a pre-petition issue. I'm sorry, I walked in late, so I need to be a bother. Yeah, but, the, yes, uh, Adam was recommending that as well. Uh, we okay, so just on, on, on that point, um, as it stands today, you can call your city councilor and say, please put this on the agenda. You can get a petition, as, which I have done. I, I got a bunch of signatures in my neighborhood we're mad about. There's no, the, the traffic on State Street. Please put this on the agenda. Um, and so that, that connection is always going to be there, plus you already have the, the, the initiatives and the referendums in case you feel the city council is not responding to you, you can take 
an issue directly to the voters. If you have a situation where, uh, again, a disgruntled minority can force the council to take up business, which they clearly don't want to do, which they, they could do if an individual citizen called them up or a petitioner presented them a petition, like, please do this. If a majority of the council or even a single council doesn't want to do it, you can have to take up business of your day when there's other pressing business to attend to, that could seriously throw a wrench in the works of the council functioning effectively. So it was a risk, it was, it was a concern that um, the council would not be able to set an agenda to act on pressing needs um, with nothing to be gained from a citizen's access point of view. A citizen access is already there. You can already bring stuff to the council as it is. So that's why the balance weighed towards leaving that out of the final recommendations. Yeah, I just, I've got a question just to stay on. Going back to, uh, or maybe I have a question for Adam. I, I believe you said it was a 50%. It, in, in the proposal you it's 50% of the, vote, of the voters who voted in the last election. That's the threshold. The number. That's the number of signatures that you need. It's how many people voted in the last local election. And you would half need, of that number. Okay. Yeah. So, although it may be untenable, I think what we're talking about here is a situation, as Adam pointed out, that is, you know, it, it's almost hard to imagine what the situation would be where you could get 50%. But I think what you're saying is it's like a, a, a catastrophic insurance policy. It's like extremely rare. So I don't necessarily support recalls, but I think the threshold is so high. And I would just say I would like to see that. I want to see this, this be passed by the city with as large a number of po as possible. And if something like this is going to bring people on board who otherwise would vote against it because of the four year, I would support it. Because I think you're, I think the, uh, sorry, you forgot your name with the last speaker. I think you're right. It's, I can't imagine getting 50%. But then again, I can't imagine, you know, Adam, you're saying it might be just one of these rare one, one time in a hundred years. So it, it needs to be in there. I would support it being in there for the sake of building consensus to get the larger issue in of whether there's support for the four year term for the mayor. The question I have in, in response to your thinking is um, goes to the process piece. I mean, you're you're in the in in the outcome analysis, like well, they, to get to that point would take so much. But the question is, how disruptive would the would the effort to get to that point be to the process, to the to governing, to governing, well, to the campaign mode? You know that, okay. that that Bill was talking about. Well, I don't see that that would be disruptive. I mean, that's just gathering signatures on a petition. The city's not involved in that, oh. short of going to. You don't think that has an impact on community well, response the, to it, it, on atmospherics? If the community was that upset that they could gain 50%, there's going to be atmospherics around an issue like that anyway. They're going to be, no, but but the they're going to be people, instead of having a legal way, we're talking about it really extreme, because I can't imagine a situation where you can get 50%. But let's suppose it happened. You're going to talk about a city that's in an uproar. They're going to be standing outside the city council doors. We're going to have situations in a case like that, like we had with the Occupy folks. We're talking about a real extreme. In terms of this, so folks can right now um, create all kinds of havoc if they want to. This is just giving them an avenue to go to the city clerk's office, pick up petitions, and petition. I'll just, my, but then I, I'll, I'll just say I feel like your outcome focus on the prospects of success ignore the impact to me of the process itself. So, and that I, so I have concerns about that. Good. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. You, you know what? Let's go to the side of the room. Uh, Gene first, and then Marianne. Okay. Or do we end up the whole time? Is there a minute? Well, Marianne's an exit. You're all right, Gene? Okay. That's why I defer to Marianne. Okay. Uh, and Marianne, you got to speak to the microphone so that. Uh, I, I would like to hear from our city clerk about the recall. Her feelings on the 50% and so forth, I, I'd like to hear that in your opinion, please. Well, the only part that I would actually be involved in is, is handing the petition out and um, making sure that it was worded properly. Um, and once the signatures were gathered, certifying that the people that signed it were actually registered voters and following the law. Um, so, I mean, it's just another added process, but, I mean, we do it for state petitions, so, I mean, it's it's not anything that we can't do. It would be a citywide special right. election. Right, exactly. 
which is and all the associated right. costs. Right. Exactly. It would be another added expense to the city for another special election. Absolutely. Great. Follow up. Yes. Um, I have to agree with Councilor Spector. I'm listening to everybody speaking. I think it's a very good idea which added Cohen has brought forth. Um, I really feel myself um, it's going to have to be really a huge issue here to have such a huge outcry in this city to go ahead and do what we're talking about. So I don't have a problem with this. I mean, to me, it's fine. So we're talking about 50%, not of the registered voters, of the, of the ones that voted in the last, so you have to certify that those that voted in the last election. No. Just the number. No, just the number. Just, just, just the number. Just the number. Yeah. So, and back to a couple of their points, if I don't see where uh, it would make that much difference. I'm trying to think, if it was 50% of the registered voters, it would be a, it would be a disaster. So I, I'm going to tell I would support it if it was of the voters that voted in the last election, because I was, I was kind of thinking about, you could mobilize the troops and... Uh, that's what you were talking about. Uh, but right. if the voters in the last but municipal election, percentage of 50% of the last municipal election voters. That's right. If 10,000 people voted in the last election, your petition needs 5,000 signatures on it. But yeah. they would have had to have voted in the last election. Oh, no, no, no. They just need to be... Um, uh, it's the same as... The same Otherwise, it would be impossible. <laughs> well, you, you, you don't understand what my point is. If you didn't vote like I said, the majority or, or a minority of people would be screaming if they didn't like the outcome of an election. Uh, I just clarify, um, our understanding was that it was 50% of registered voters at the last election. Um, the, the reason being is that if, say you have a small local election, only 2,000 people go out to vote, you know, you, fifty percent of that would be a thousand. That would be a very good low threshold. So I think with the initiative and the referendum. And I'm not 100% sure, but my understanding was it was 50% of registered voters at the time of the last election. So it's registered voters and not, not ballots cast. That's my understanding. Is that? Well, that's a big difference. That yeah. 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 That's a big difference. Do you understand that difference? All right. Uh, this is the back to Methu, and this is how they phrase it. Um, shall have been signed by at least 50% of the number of voters of the city who have voted in the last preceding right. local election. election. Well, that, that actually then so is a point of fact. Well, it could be a, a very low threshold. Yeah, and I think we can, we can trap that. Right. right. You can right. set any threshold, yeah, right. you want. It's your. I mean, if you took 50% of 19,000 registered voters, <laughs> that's different than, you know, uh, 10,000 people coming out to vote. Tom, yeah. You know, one of the uh, things that you may want to consider is as opposed to the last municipal election, the last regular municipal election, because if you have special elections and you have very low voter turnout, for a, a council position or council at large, then, and somebody says, well, let's mount a recall petition uh, for, the, for the mayor because we only have to, you know, get 2,500 signatures. So I think it, if you're going in that direction, just be very aware of how you word it so that it, it gets what you, what you want. Oh, uh, it, uh, before Tom went away, yeah. uh, I was gonna ask you a question. Okay. And then David, David Murphy's next. So, but uh, Gene has a question. Before you said it, you, you came forward in the recommendations here with just for to change the mayor's term to four years. So the discussion about the two years was just tossed up. Was there anything about the recall position or anything like that discussed? If it was a two-year term or? We felt that it was not appropriate in a two-year term at all. I think that that was... A a unanimous consensus. consensus. Never, each of us felt that way. I think that, uh, uh, as Todd said, and as I said earlier, I think that there were a few people that were adamant against a recall, and uh, many of the rest of us uh, uh, may have not been adamant one way or another, and we're willing to go along with uh, the will of a few people. So, you, I mean, you're having the you're having the right discussion, and uh, it's just a matter of if you're going to if you're going to do it. Just be careful how you word it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming that all elected officials are recallable. Um, I believe this is only for the elected official who will be serving four years. That's what uh, our, that's being what's recommended. As I understand it, now 
probably don't understand correctly, but this is uh, as being offered as a counterpoint to the extended four-year term. Payment. So only the mayor position is recalled. And if we go with the last municipal election, there's one of my concerns about separating the mayor from all the rest of the elected people is that off year could have a very low voter turnout if there if there aren't meaningful ward races. Um, <coughs> we've seen at times when there may only be two seats contested in that off year, the turnout could be very low. So you, if you tie it to people who last voted in municipal election and there was only two contested ward seats, you could be trying to recall a mayor based on a very low vote count citywide because people may not go if there's no nothing going on. Um, well, the, the, last, why? the last municipal election before the most recent one was Owens. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, you no know, knock against Ward 3, but it certainly was a pretty good one. The, the, you have to get 50%. But, but even this, even that the off your citywide election, <laughs> if there's a, even the off your citywide, if there's only two yeah. contested out of nine seats, it could be very low and, and have a very low threshold for recalling the mayor after that election. If you wanted to, you just, just it would be better to wait till after that off your election, and your threshold would be much lower. Paul's next. So, I think you pointed someone point out. We we can set it where we want. But I would suggest I, I mean, doing 50 percent of the registered voters is pretty high. I mean, I've, I've looked at recall elections. It is not easy to get petitions are not like just voting. I mean, it's a very different thing. You're not going to to get 50 percent of the registered voters to sign a petition to get people out there is. Basically, I think it's kind of silly to put forward. But we could do some other percentage of registered voters. We could also do based on the voters in the last state election. So there's something where it's a higher, we know it's a higher degree of turnout. Keep the, the level of need very high so people aren't just going to, you know, or try and organize a petition drive knowing. Most people aren't going to try and organize a petition drive knowing they're not going to achieve a goal. And this would be a very high threshold. So we could set our own percentage, even a percentage of the uh, of the registered voters. Yeah. So this is on. This is part of the subject. Um, I'm not in favor of a four-year term. I think two years is sufficient. I think two years is accountable. I don't like the idea that two years. That if you really are upset with the mayor, you vote out the council. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, you vote out the mayor if you're upset with the mayor. So that's what you do. Um, I think that uh, there aren't. There isn't that we have not experienced in Northampton that massive disruption that, that a mayor must campaign every two years. Yes, the mayor has to campaign every two years, but I don't believe that it's a massive disruption. I don't believe that the mayors are forced to make politically expedient decisions because they're up for re-election next year. I'm not in favor of the four-year term, but if the majority of the council is in favor of the four-year term, then I would absolutely be uh, again, for a recall provision. And um, the recall provision it seemed very suitable to me was the one from Methuen. 50% uh, of the actual voters in the last mayoral election, only for the mayor. That's very reasonable to me. And um, that's it. Uh, Marianne? Yeah, um, I am not for a four-year term for a mayor. I think that city councilor should be two years and a mayor should be two years. I'm really having a problem about this four years versus counselors two years. It's been more work being placed in the city clerk's office in my eyes. I think if we're going to do it, we should do it equally. That we all run the same time. I just feel that something does not look right here. Four years on a mayor, two years on city counselors. Would there be a problem? There could be a problem. Um, I think politically there could be a problem. Could we weigh in kind of like a jury that's not an official vote? Because right, if we're not going to support the four-year thing, yeah, then, then we don't have to argue about that. Right. <laughs> well, so, well I, mean, actually, I think it's relevant to take on this it's issue. It's relevant yeah. to discuss yeah. it. I think exactly. that uh, it's appropriate to vote on even straw vote. I have a we'll want the whole straw vote. I think it wouldn't that, be a struggle. Let's just go around and talk about what people are. want to get the temperature of the board. Just the temperature of Yeah. All right, why don't you start? Okay. I, I am for the four-year term, however, if it's going to create, I, I really want to see the charter review, this passed by a vast majority of people. And if the four-year term is going to be such that 
will have a very split community and a lot of arguments about it. I'm not so strongly behind it that I wouldn't say, let's just go with two years. So I do support the four-year term. I have seen that I think there is a kind of six months before the election, so you're only, you, you get elected, you're in for a few months settling in, and then six months before the, elect, the next election, you've only really been in for like a year and a half, you're already raising money and going on to the next election. So I think there is some need that the mayor can have a longer vision, be in there longer, trying to achieve some of those things. But again, I'm not so strongly behind it that I would be in that I have some preference for two years because I don't like the thought of that off your election without the mayor, because people don't come to vote. And I think it strands a lot of other it strands a lot of other candidates without having the mayor there. And I think we've seen throughout our history there's sometimes when mayors run unopposed, and uh, and there's sometimes when mayors are contested and they're not always opposed, and sometimes they're only opposed in a very token way. So I, I think if, if it was up to me, I'd stick with the two years. I would say I have a non-passionate preference for four years. Um, and, um, and I, I would say that my preference is based on, on the fact that I think our city has more to gain without, uh, without I would call it the distraction, even though I know it's, it's about democracy. But the, the, the experience, like Paul was saying, of the, um, the many months, I mean, you're, it feels very quick. It feels very quick to have to be um, focusing on a campaign. And, um, and I feel like there's a cost. I think there's a cost um, in, and we can't quite know it because we can't live two lives at the same time. We can't know what we're not getting by virtue of our mayor needing to be engaged. Hopefully, if there's a campaign, I want it to be a real one. I mean, I don't, you know, I, so, so, so hopefully there's, there's, you know, it's a meaningful debate and it's, um, and a meaningful contest. And assuming that is the case, then it's just, it's just there's a law of nature that there's just so much time in a day, and and I and I, I have an instinct that says we lose something with this constant transition period, and or you know ter potential turnover, or the threat of the turnover, or the fact of a campaign. We lose we lose community. I mean, lose gain. It's complicated, which is what goes to my non-passionate. But the, the because. It is, I, the, the part that's for it, or that it would be fine with it, is that it is democracy at its finest. It is a chance. It is essentially like our public referendum on the mayor, and we have that, and we have that opportunity um, every two years. And that's, that's a good thing. But, you know, the process, then, even for the community, our energy, whoever you're for, is spent working for that person, not on a particular issue in the, on behalf of the community. And I have ambivalence about that. And, so I would have a preference. I feel like I'd want to have the experiment before your mayor. Um, and that makes me um, in favor to see what our community could gain from that. But, um, but I do acknowledge what we, what we get as a community through a process of an election every two years. And that's what makes me unpassionate. I, I agree. Uh, generally with Councilor Freeman Daniels. I think that the four-year mayor term is generally uh, found in cities of greater size than ours. And I think of similar sized cities, um, it's generally two years. For example, East Hampton, Holyoke, Westfield, uh, Greenhouse, three years, not four. Um, and I also think that, I'm not sure if, if, if mayors in North are, are always campaigning to the point where they, they can't where it's difficult to govern in the past. You know, it's, it's, it, hotly contested elections um, are few and far between in this, in this city, and in the past several decades there have only been a few. Um, but I would support the four-year term if we had a recall that was similar to uh, the one in the Thruin. doesn't necessarily need to be exactly the same, but similar to it, if that's will of the entire council. Um, I actually favor the four-year term, and I, and I favor for some of the reasons that have been advanced. I think we should make the distinction between administrative and legislative. The, um, the mayor is serves as, as, as the ex 
executive director, essentially the administrator of the city business, and we as the legislators have, uh, should have, as a two-year term, be more responsive to an election on a regular basis and more frequent basis. The mayor, on the other hand, you want uh, the, the, you know, for instance, if you go to Amherst, there is no election for the city manager. It's, that person's hired or fired based on that. But at the same time, they give them pretty wide latitude as to how they will conduct the city business, the official business of administrating the, the city. When part of having a two-year term is you're requiring your mayor to be a politician. And, and what I mean that is that we're requiring them to be a perpetual politician, uh, constantly, uh, you know, and, and I haven't seen a distortion of that here. And by the way, I mean, we're not speaking about case specific because I don't think in my time here, I've never seen a mayor function uh, based on making political expedient choices for the prospect of trying to retain their mayorship. But at the same time, I have seen mayors who have been encumbered by the prospect of an election, which actually, when larger administrative issues become the big political wedge issue, we've seen that happen. And it, and it, it does affect the, at least by my reckoning, the function of the city. We as counselors, I think we owe. It. We need. We need. We need to check in. We need to be checked in. We need to be held to accounts because we are representative. We're the aspect of representative government. We have been asked to be the representative voices. And when we come up short, or the constituents consider us coming up short, then we should be held to accounts on that. Um, I mean, I actually would. I would promote the four-year term and would be willing to accept the the, the recall. Although I think. The one thing about the recall with me is it's, it seems pretty token. It, it doesn't actually seem like an effect. I mean, he, you're right. We'd have to have things have to be pretty egregious. I mean, short of, and and not felonious. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, this, we're not problems. But <laughs> if 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 the mayor has committed a felony, then there are other mechanisms in which the mayor can be removed in that in handcuffs. But the but but but. <laughs> And I take Councilor Spector's point that I think I think it's critically important that this document move and it be passed, and that that we, for the first time in 130 years, will realize a new modernized charter. And and I and I'm always a little nervous about anything that might create a bigger wrinkle. But I do think this is I think that's a valid point. I think that that but for the most the most critical feature, those are the reasons why I think a four-year term is appropriate. And I think a two-year term uh, distinction. I take Council Murphy's point about the issue about uh, uh, attendance at elections. I think that's on us. I think that we're required to make our case to the public that it, this is an important fact. And sometimes, as we all know, and Wendy can attest to this, a lot of heavy lifting to get people to come to elections. But I would also hold up Council Owen Freeman Daniels in a, in a special election in the middle of the summer, got an amazing turnout. And he got uh, he got a, 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 count, a ward engaged in the political discourse and debate. So I don't think that that should necessarily be the criteria by which we make this decision. And Marianne, we know how you feel about for your term. Gene, what's your thought? Well, getting out the vote on an off. I'm concerned about the off year. I, I pound the pavement on Ward Seven to try and get people to vote. We actually get 52 percent. But I did a lot of work uh, knocking on doors uh, and. So, and it also keeps a mayor on his toes every two, you know every two year election. He's he's not a, it's not campaigning. He's constantly campaigning by his actions, by the job that he's doing. So I'm not convinced that he has to go out and campaign while he's in office so much because his actions in office are his campaign. Um, so I, I, there's a lot to be said for that too. And. and Maybe you want the mayor to be a perpetual politician um, to some degree. Uh, you don't want to let his guard down, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, and he needs to be accountable just like the, just like the council does. Um, in two years, uh, I've watched it. I can only go back as far as David Kramer. So beyond that, I don't know. I can't say anything about that. But David Kramer and, and uh, then Buzz Chapman and Buzani and Ford and it, I mean uh, two years 
it's never really created a problem. As far as I know, I, I, I've looked at it. I don't see any problem that's ever been created by a two-year uh, uh, mayoral term. Um, in the recall petition, I, I haven't figured that out yet, the number of voters or, or how you would come up with that. But you don't get 50% of the registered voters to vote. Yeah. So as far as coming up with 50% uh, recall petition, I don't know. I've always been comfortable with a two-year mayor uh, position. I think uh, I, w I would opt for two-year. And never mind the recall petition. I think it's complicated. Uh, it requires more language. You're going to need an attorney to figure it out. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm really in favor of the two-year uh, term. Todd, can, can I just um, sound in and, and sort of clarify um, what I believe to be the position of the, the Charter Drafting Committee? I think we looked at this as what is the best practice. Um, if you look across the country, best practice is considered a council manager form of government. For um, whatever reason, that hasn't taken in Massachusetts. And, um, but the, the idea behind a council manager form of government is you insulate the chief executive of the city, which is the mayor, um, from the political winds um, uh, that they can be subjected to. Um, I think that was our thinking, is that having a chief executive who could stand up and lead the city, do what's best for the city, and not be subjected to sort of a constant campaign mode. Um, I understand your feeling that they should be subjected, but I think just the, the, the best practice is considered to sort of insulate the mayor from those forces. Um, and that it, very much along the lines that Bill articulated, but that, that's more the thinking that I recall of, of, the, of the Charter Drafting Committee. So. Yeah, just, just, just to add to that, um, I mean, the question is, when is the best point in time for the public uh, to directly hold the mayor accountable? Because uh, sometimes, and this is, our th you know, this is a debatable point, of course, but the committee's thinking was some proposals, <laughs> some ideas might look a little better after four years than two if they're given a chance to work, if they're given a chance to have a uh, fuller discussion. Uh, sometimes the gut reaction from the public, uh, the public may decide later on, maybe that, maybe that initial gut reaction wasn't correct. Uh, so, uh, so that's what I'm mean. talking about insulation. It's not to say that it should be somehow anti-democratic and that uh, the public shouldn't get a say. Uh, but uh, when, how long does it take for the public to take the full measure of a mayoral agenda? And to go back to my earlier point and to Councilor Brown Daniel's concern about that, it's not, at the two-year point, you wouldn't just lash out the council randomly. But if the public was seriously uh, distressed with the direction a mayor was taking, and there was a councilor that was identified with that agenda, you could send a signal to the mayor, hey, I'm, I'm a little concerned with where your direction where you're going in. Maybe you should t do a course correction. So you still have an opportunity to weigh in in that respect, but still giving the mayor some elbow room to say, you know what, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm going the wrong track. Maybe if I stay on this track, you'll see it in a different light in two years. Uh, so I think that's where the committee was at. Um, the charter is essentially the division of power, the expression of the division of power. And we're also talking about the checks and balances that we often talk about. And to your point about the accountability, uh, the, the mayor will still stand, regardless of the elections, accountable to the public. Um, in, in, in the very manifestation of their job, they're also accountable to the council. Our job is if we feel, I mean, we, we wield power as a council, as a collective or collaborative body, that we also serve as checks and balance to, to mayor or executive power. The other thing about long-term planning which is critical in every city, and a lot of long-term planning gets kind of balled up in election cycle stuff, uh, particularly for an administrator, for an executive director, is if they're thinking that they can't see through a long-term plan, and when we're talking long-term, we're talking four years, it's not particularly long. Normally these things are gauged every 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And, and to the point that Bill Scher brought up, that, that in order to put policy into effect, if you're thinking as a mayor, trying to establish a policy that would at least be seen through for four years to see whether it fails or, or, or succeeds. In which case, there's, there's, a, there's a new latitude that's given to 
to the executive office. And, and, and I think worth exploring, worth investigating. Uh, and, and it's, but by and large, I think that, that, that we bear our share of the burden as well as, as representative. I still believe that I'm having a problem with the four years. I mean, we've had a mayor every two years who was elected, she did her job. What happens when the consulate can explain this to me? Somebody's in for four years and then they're not doing well. I think we need to have, if you want to go for four years, some kind of protection within that four year block. Because the, 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 people the, would not be able to do anything. That person's there. I, I, I think part of the problem is that yeah, go ahead. that protection is called being elected every two years. Right. Or, or, well, then we could take it to an even further degree to be elected every year. I mean, so, if, if, I mean it depends on, on your threshold of accountability. And what we're talking about is actually designing a system that relies, that, that will allow some flexibility in the executive director. This is, this is just this is one man speaking on this point. Just to point out, we used to be elected. But the mayor used to be part time here. It was not a full time. Not as long as I've been. Oh no, I'm talking way back. Oh, talking with Port of Alderman. Yeah. One year. I think a lot of people have talked about being the mayor here as being the manager of a hundred or ninety million dollars or whatever our budget is. Business or corporation or organization. I mean, I've heard that used by people on all sides. Of it. It's really a managerial position, and it's becoming more so. I think things change. We had a time when it was part time. We had a time when it probably was elected, and way back was probably elected in a you know a church somewhere, and votes were taken one evening, and you know somebody might have gotten it who didn't even want to run for it when he met the meeting. So. Things change, and I think we are in a time when we agree that the mayor's position very much, you have to learn a lot of details. Let's just look at one specific one, which we, I, I've watched as our former mayor, uh, Claire, dealt with issues around insurance. And as she became, through the years, she became more and more articulate in understanding all the nuances, and was then able, in her last year, to be able to come forward and did really great bargaining to get our insurance out. And a lot of that came from her, and it was learning in that position. And that was very much like somebody running any kind of business. How am I going to get insurance for my employees? We wouldn't, if we were sitting here, and I was talking about running a big business and we were a board of directors, I would certainly be sitting here and saying, boy, four years would be minimal, and I'm not suggesting anything longer. But I think two years is just a short time as a manager. It, it, it's a different position. And it's becoming more and more like a manager than we have, as Bill pointed out, as legislators. And that's why I think to learn the job, I mean, look at the different pieces, and so many of them, like you're the um, supervisor of a number of people, just developing those relationships, learning how somebody works and how to manage them, doesn't just happen overnight. And we have professional departments now. We don't have part-time people, we have professional departments, so supervising those people, just imagine yourself, you're coming into a big company, you're hired, you've got two years to do all these various things. I think it's way too short, but as I said, what I want to see is close to consensus on the issue, and if we can get there, great. If not, I'll back away from the four years. What's, what's hard for me is that I, I have to see, I see both sides, and I agree. I mean, I agree with what you're saying. You're good good. Just, I, I also understand, I also say, I mean, I, Mayors, the mayor has a lot of judgment that goes into the job, and um, so I, I think that two years is good for accountability. Uh, I said, oh, I'm just not going to repeat all that stuff. Yeah, I don't. I, got you. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I came out first for the two years. I don't want you to think that I'm hard charging and I, I'm not I listening to what you guys are saying. Okay. I agree. Um, and I'm um, I also think we probably. I just permit me. I think we we talked about this for over an hour. Right. So it's good. I'm, I'm glad we're hearing this out. Though. The uh, um, Gene, you had some other. Were there other issues, or were those the ones that you were? Because you had, you were so far the only person who's declared uh, some good genuine concerns. So let's let's hear what those. Um, are. Could you just explain to me what? 
I think I have it, but liberally in favor of the city on page two. Under construction, section one, one dash five. Liberally in favor of the city. What part of the page? Uh, right down the bottom, of the, uh, construction. Last paragraph. I just, uh, Page two. Yeah. Yes, page two. That's section one dash five. Except for the charter. Could something from the charter? Maybe. I think that's a, I think that's a legal term. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we drafted that. Meaning, yeah. meaning that if it's if it's not. Maybe we can. Yeah. 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 I just think that that means that the powers are. Liberally, in, in the liberal sense, as opposed to assigning a liberal conservative type of uh, uh, meaning to the word liberally, of course, means freely. Or, and it, oh, well, let's ask the lawyer. We've got a judge. Or the 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 judge. The way that I, that I understand the term is that if there's a, if there's a determination that's going before a judge in a court as to how to interpret the document, it's going to be interpreted in favor of uh, giving more authority to the municipality, to the city, as opposed to the contestant. So in other words, if, it, if, it, if a judge is looking at it and trying to balance where does this go, the balance is going to tip in favor of the, of the city of Northampton. So with all things being equal, then the, the city of Northampton gets better. Yes, generally, or the interpretation by the city as to what the charter means as opposed to uh, somebody challenging something pursuant to a provision of the char charter. That's how I would feel it. That's the sense I have. That was generic language, right? That's yes, standard, that's standard yes. language. So that's, that's well, standard language, fairly well, standard? I don't know because I'm not familiar with them any other, other charters, but there, there certainly is uh, language, or uh, at least through the... Uh, to the courts uh, with regard to uh, giving deference to municipal cities by zoning boards, by planning boards, things of that nature. In other words, the courts are going to say that these are the people that are running the city. Uh, if they've decided something in a particular fashion, we're going to give deference to the way that uh, they decided should happen. And just, just to clarify on one additional point, the, um, the template that we were given was sort of a legal boilerplate um, that Stephen McGoldrick gave us. Uh, he said this was a template for a modern charter in the state of Massachusetts with a lot of sort of blanks that we had to decide, make and turn to the mayor, recall, all those things. But the language in here is legal boilerplate that apparently has been scrubbed by the legislature, by the assembly, and is, is approved language for a, for a modern charter. Um, so we didn't, we didn't draft <coughs> this, it came to us, and we filled in the blanks. I had another boilerplate question while you're, while, while sure. you're there. Under, under prohibitions, it says that no member of page six prohibitions, no member of the city council shall hold any other compensated city position. Now, I have a question, and it, it actually affects me. I'm, I'm elected as city council. I'm also elected the elector under the will of Oliver Smith, which I guess is not compensated. I think. The charter says I get $15 a year, but that's probably been in there since 1850, and I certainly have never gotten $15 <laughs> from the city for doing it. Uh, uh, but yeah, I could probably also with interest probably. But is that is that a conflict under this, and or was that part of the board? That was boilerplate, and actually came up in our discussions because I think there's some other offices, trustee of Forbes, or some other. Yeah, Jesse, at one point I think you not now, but in your first term you were finishing out your term. Right. And it would present, it would hypothetically present some problems, but again, it was best practice, and if I recall correctly, we decided to leave that in. But I'll let Tom um, speak to that in more detail. We did have a lot of discussion over that. I personally was opposed to it, uh, but the, because I felt that it precluded uh, a number of people from being able to serve on city council if they held any uh, paid position within the city, whether it be an employee of the Department of Public Works, uh, the school, school system, etc. But that's what it means. If you you can't receive any compensation from any other uh, uh, position in the city, so. 
in this instance, it's uncompensated. This is compensated. In, what do you mean by in this instance? The, uh, the other position is uncompensated. Yes. He's, yes. he's receiving yeah. no remuneration yeah. for it. Yeah. So then that's okay. Yeah. Okay, but not compensated. And I'm assuming the one year prohibition for a city councilor to be employed, you know, we're shopping for a city solicitor. Under the new charter, Jesse would not be eligible until a year after he was. That's right. Jesse, you have a question? That's your question. No, I have Yeah, I was just talking about definition. Um, Gene, do you still have some? Yeah, um, appointments by the mayor. Uh, page 13. Sometimes we only get, um, and it says in here, we only get one application. Or, or uh, let's see here. Well, it's in two places in here, actually. Um, it talks about an application that comes in from the mayor for approval of the city, by, approved by the city council. And it says, only that applicant that the mayor would like to appoint. Yeah. Yeah. Did we, could, the, could the other applications come before the council? Is there any way to facilitate that? I'm just, that? I'm just asking. Yeah. I'd like to address that as Because you guys are in the appointments and evaluations. Yeah. And the, the, what I want to address is, if you look at any legislative body, like the, the president doesn't send down four appointments applications for the Supreme Court. They send down one. I think that's in a similar mode. He's saying, look, this is who I want for the position. You can reject it, and then I'll send somebody else. And I think that's the way it happens in most legislative bodies. The mayor can say, has the option to say, look, I'm going to send you three choices. You guys can decide. The point is if they want to do that. But I think this is the way you need to do it. We've talked about this many times before, as if we on the city council were saying, give us six appointments. Well, I mean, just to be a little facetious here, well, the mayor could decide that, okay, I'm going to give you one, Jesse Adams, we're going to pick on you all night, and then I'm going to give you a few other people who don't even, you know, who are totally unqualified, but I'll give you Jesse Adams, you know, Donald Duck. I just think this is the way you do it when the, the executive holds the power to get the folks that they want. That's part of being chosen as mayor. The reason I brought it up was we had back and forth on the Board of Health appointment with members of the Board of Health and who was going to be. I'm sure you remember was, that. The Board That's of Health was somewhat different in that the Board of Health is a comp. We, we were the ones who select that, so right. that's different. Yeah. We choose that member, so therefore we have multiple applicants for that. But for the director, that was an appointment. Mm -hmm. And that was the one where only one. That's thing. right. Of course, because members of the Board of Health had asked why there weren't more applications, why they didn't see more applicants. But that was why I brought it up. Yep. I mean, it was a long discussion back and forth. Yep. Uh, went on for months. Um, um, I know with Councilor Spector and I being on appointments and evaluations, and uh, Councilor David Murphy, I mean, we have been told by the mayor that at any time we ever want to come in and take a look at applications, we are welcome to do that. So the visibility is there. Well, you can go into the mayor's office and look at applicants. So I don't have a problem with Just a point of information, that's not, that is not mandated in the charter, just so clear on that. So that, that, that should there be a mayor who decides they don't want you to see the appointments? We've got to put it in there. Then. Well, <laughs> well calls <laughs> So this was, this was discussed by the redrafting committee. Um, under authority to make appointments, their summary. Summary, yeah. It's, uh, it's the appendix. And also, uh, page eight of the Yes, page eight as well, I think. Um, this, this came partially to my suggestion. I, I think other councilors supported it as well. But, um, you know, we're talking at a, at a high level here when we're talking about the charter. We're not talking about whether the proper process is that the mayor nominates because the mayor has the power. We're talking about whether the mayor should have the power to nominate. And I do believe the mayor should have the power to nominate. But I also believe that the city councilor should have, can also have the power to nominate. And I don't see that as detracting from choice. I don't see discussing people's 
uh, qualifications as humiliating to them. And uh, I think that it is a good way to uh, broaden the perspectives that our city boards and bodies, which are not elected, uh, could uh, in fact uh, comprise. <coughs> so I am uh, I'm a little disappointed that uh, this wasn't included in the draft, but uh, I, I will advocate putting it back in uh, that uh, a counselor with a, maybe a second from another counselor would be able to nominate someone to a board uh, or, uh, or commission or, or other multiple member body. And so, just to be clear, so if the council appointed them, it would be the councilors, the city councils, purview to then vote on that person, where would the mayors, would, would the mayor not be part of that process? Can I, yeah, sure, yeah, I think I think that the committee um, discussed multiple different elements of the proposal. My, what I, I did never, I never envisioned that the mayor would nominate someone, that person would go through the process of, of um, appointment and evaluations, come before the council, and then the councilor, some other councilor says, well, I nominate Joe Jesse Adams, you know, and, and then suddenly this last minute no, complication arose. Um, obviously, the, the way the procedure, I, I don't have a perfect procedure, I don't think the, the procedure needs to be perfectly spelled out here, but the procedure, the way I expected it would be, there would be a public posting about opening, about, a, about an opening on a position. There would be a time limit or a, day, a cutoff day for that, for nominations. Yeah. Any, all nominations would have to be in, whether it comes from the mayor's office or from the two counselors, and then it's set to appointments and evaluations, presumably, but it would first come before the council and then refer to. It would go through the normal process. That was how I envisioned it. The, um, the charter, such as it is, and such as it will be, is essentially a live document for that DDs and uh, In fact, the charter we're dealing with now was kept on life support for so long that it's not, it's, it's hard to recognize as a live document. The fact is that there were, we have the ability, after the fact of moving this, should we move this, to amend over the course of time with, with a, a more expansive discussion and debate about some of these issues. And I, I think, we're, and, I, and I'm not speaking specifically this issue, I'm speaking holistically. That, I mean, if there are something that we take a real scun or two here, and, um, should come to the point where it needs to be revised. We have within our powers, in fact, from what I understand, there's more latitude to amend your charter now. I think part of the thing, some of this, and this is what we're trying to also gauge, is what qualifies as charter level change and what qualifies as rules, ordinances. Yeah. And right now we have a document that's also filled with 180 some odd special acts that were done with a, a, a various assumed authorities or it seemed appropriate at the time, but certainly don't seem appropriate now. They seem time-specific and issue-specific, and I think that flexibility is built in that we should deal with that as not only we, but any future council and any future administrative government deal with those issues as they come up. And the, the document that we're being presented with essentially is, is the, well, if we look at it, Metaphorically, which is, I'd like to go to metaphors, that we look at this, we asked an architectural review board to come up with an architectural design. And before we start putting on, we, we don't want to start putting on all the window treatments and everything else. What we want to do is advance this architectural design, this basic premise, before we start adding wings or anything like that. That our job is to try and get a, a simple, rudimentary, clear outline of what it is we want advance presented to the to the citizens to vote on. And then we are then, you know, I think we're not gonna go willy nilly and go crazy, but the fact is that we do have an opportunity to tweak, modify, change, not necessarily the charter, but also our rules and ordinance. If Todd you have Yeah, I just wanted to make um, to follow up on the on the nomination issue. Um, and just to give you some some context, I, I would encourage you all to read the executive summary and the bullet points because it it really sort of summarizes um, our thinking, and then in the bullet points, more of the minutes of our discussion. Um, 
And uh, as Barry has said, I think that's valuable to understand how we came to these decisions. Um, one of the big themes in our deliberations was trying to empower the council um, in a way that it's currently perhaps empowered, but that does by shifting the chairman of the council or the chair of the council to the president of the council, um, that creates a separation of powers and creates more autonomy for the council. I think the perception about nominations was allowing the council to usurp the mayor in that role would be a bit of a power grab. Um, and we weren't comfortable going that far. We felt the, power, the powers of the mayor are to make appointments. And for the council to say, well, we're going to make appointments as well, um, that didn't go down well with us in general. Um, and uh, I would just caution you before going that far. We're, we're, I think we were shifting the charter to give more autonomy to the council. Um, you could take more autonomy if you so choose, but I'm not sure that's going to go down well with the voters um, if they perceive it as a power grab. So I just wanted to, to make that point. Alex probably does just continue to speak about it if no one else wants to. <laughs> against it. Um, yeah, I mean, we can go right through the, the discussion of arguments in favor of just having the mayor nominate. Um, really, it's, I think the biggest one is tradition, history. That's what the mayor always has done. Um, and then the specifics are that uh, the structure, that you can still have counselors ask the mayor nicely to uh, to nominate someone, that's yeah. always, you can always ask the mayor. Uh, or, um, and then the last one, that, that uh, it, it might have a chilling effect. That is, if someone knows that they're, that if someone wants to be on the planning board, for whatever reason, I don't understand why they ever would, but if they want to be on the planning board, but they know that they're qualified, that other people also want to be on the planning board, that their qualifications would be openly debated, that they would cease to want to be on the planning board or something like that. Um, to me, that's uh, um, that's that's like saying we shouldn't make uh, delicious cookies because everyone would want them, and then not everyone would, have, would get enough. Uh, th that only that argument only works if a number of people want to serve. So it, the chilling effect, are, I think, is is uh, non-existent. Um, I do think that the, having counselors nominate uh, people for boards and committees does a couple things. One, I think it allows for a broader representation on boards and committees. Uh, I also want to say, I mean, if we're, worried about, if we're worried about getting this thing passed, what I hear, um, not, I, I, it's not like I go around the city asking for negative views of previous administrations or this or that, but I, I have heard a lot that people believe that entrenched mayors will install people who have the similar political views on boards and committees, uh, and that um, I think if this, if we add this element as a council, if we add it, then um, it will be more palatable to people who might be against uh, the way things are. Right. Well, one of the things that we may do is some middle ground. I, I don't quite see how it would work to say a council would get appoint people. Basically, it's just like you would be doing now. If there's, it doesn't force the mayor in some way to do it. There's no structure in place. So I don't understand the structure that would happen. And one of the things we have talked about appointments, and we've discussed this for a few years, and this may be speak to your point, Bill, this isn't in the charter, but it's something we look at through ordinance, is that perhaps the council should have a number of more committees where the council makes the appointments. In other words, they're not mayor's appointments and that we might want to take responsibility for that. There were times where it felt like that actually might relieve the mayor, but there are a lot of appointments the mayor makes, and we often had to say, what's going on here? It's like we're six months behind. And so that may be a discussion, but again, it may not be a discussion for the charter, but rather an issue to address what you're saying is, let's change some of the ways in which, by ordinance, the way this, the committees are, are structured, and I would, I would go along with that, and there are a number that I could see the council being the ones who are in charge of the whole process of appointment? Um, it's quarter eight. Um, we have a number of other issues. Uh, one was already touched on with uh, Todd had mentioned the, the council presidency presiding over the council meeting. Um, did anyone have any thoughts about that one way, Todd? We want to take this out of context for present personalities. Yes. Yeah. 
I, please, and in fact, I think Judge Perlman would back me up on this. We are not talking about the warm bodies who are present yes. tonight. We're talking about some that haven't even been conceived yet. And the and the thing is that uh, the issue of the council presidency um, is it, it, there. There are two things. One is the special election, which holds. I hold very dear to my heart because I wish that were in effect right now, to be quite honest. The, in the event that the mayor, and particularly either four or two year term, is not able to fill or complete their term, that there be a special election uh, established the same, uh, with the same criteria that are currently established for uh, council reports. <coughs> I think that is a glaring oversight in the current charter, one that has to be rectified. But I've, in fact, I haven't heard much controversy relevant to that. I'd like it to be implemented immediately, but I doubt that's likely. Um, the, uh, and then the issue of the council presidency presiding. Um, Mary Ford, who was here, um, spoke, I, I thought rather eloquently, with some reservations about that circumstance and, and talking about the value of having the mayor preside. Uh, and so the, he wasn't, this wasn't without debate. This didn't. This wasn't uh, presented as, as you know, complete consensus by the population. And I think uh, uh, former council president Pat Goggins also testified this as well. But anyone else have any yeah, thoughts on that? I have some th First, I want to uh, suggest we all do read the executive piece on each of these, because as Todd suggested, it covers a lot of the arguments on both sides, so that we don't have to recreate the arguments. I think it's a very well done executive summary. Um, and. Um, in some ways, I want to yield to the charter committee because I was there that night with the arguments uh, for and against and heard them, and they went on rather extensively. So, you know, there's a way in which these are folks we asked to do this. They put in a lot of hours, and I'm not saying you shouldn't disagree with some of the things, but kind of like we should approach it to give them the power, is it liberally, um, to err on their side. And so, I'm the one who started by not wanting to, um, I wanted to have the mayor continue to be the chair, and I was pretty strong in that. And now I'm kind of, I haven't moved toward having the council president's chair, but I've moved towards kind of being in the middle on this particular issue. Um, what would your objection? My objections? Um, it's addressed in the executive summary, and they ad address my, my concern that it might have diminished the flow of information, that how do you set the agenda, and all those arguments came out in that evening. And uh, I was, Okay, so those are my concerns. It's the mayor who's sitting, you know, who sets the agenda for the meeting? Are we going to, and the mayor's the one who's so much more in touch. I was concerned that would the mayor be involved in that? How would the mayor be involved? Again, I'm still for the mayor doing it, but I think my initial concerns about switching it, which are addressed in the executive summary, have been won over a little bit, or quite a bit. Also, one of the concerns is that you want the mayor present in order to provide information. Yeah, Jeff. We can require the mayor to be at yes. the meetings along with the finance council yep. uh, director or whoever else they deem appropriate. We can also have the mayor sit at the table with us uh, as the yep. finance director does now and simply be there to answer anything that we may ask while the council president yep. chairs. Uh, part of my concern that I had expressed was the power conferred to a council president could make them a de facto mayor if you had someone who was pretty good wheeler and dealer, and they've addressed it actually, I think, if they, uh, uh, the way it was originally discussed, the council president could literally block the mayor's agenda from ever getting to the council floor, and then effectively render the mayor moot if they had a political ambition to, to discuss <coughs> their administration, that the council president with a great deal of power. This actually requires a consultation with the mayor. I, I think you would like to say that the mayor's agenda should be put on the council agenda, and not just the consultation, but that he is part of the, is part of the deliberative process with, with the council president, even if they're confrontational. In fact, they may even have conflicting agendas, that both agendas may be put for the floor for the council to discuss. And uh, that was one of my principal concerns. The other thing is the council president could uh, essentially with one specific council agenda uh, because the council president would be a voting member as well, um, could actually 
a very conniving one could actually manipulate the process of debate. And uh, through through uh, rules and, and some clever use of the rules. And so my concern is that I don't, uh, I am concerned the council president could run roughshod over the council, although, you know, they'd be accountable after two years. Yes? I, uh, I agree with that second point in a different way. Um, I'm, I'm actually worried about the council president being able to express, to act as a counselor. Um, you know, they have, they must be neutral uh, when they, so. Although they, that's not stipulated in but is that, is that isn't it in Robert's rules? The, the the presiding officer has to. Well, I believe. I, I mean, so I think we lose through the vote. Uh, no, no, they they vote, but they they're in debate. If they want, if they wish to enter into debate, they must cast the gavel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So see. that that's actually my concern. The wheeler dealer cuts both ways. It cuts with the mayor versus the council. It doesn't matter who the chair is. So I think that the uh, especially if it's the mayor's agenda. So I, I think that doesn't affect it as much as neutral, the presumed neutrality of the chair. Um, I've attended the meetings also, and I also recall when Mary Claire Higgins spoke out in regards to she did not have a problem of the mayor not being the chair of city council. I feel that there should not be a problem with the council president. That person has to be as equal as can be. Um, the Stanton, they run it without a mayor running their city council meetings. They have a, pre uh, a president and a vice president, and their committees run very, very well. So I don't have a problem about a mayor that has to chair our city council meetings. I mean, we are part of government, and I think we should stay as being part of the government and being city councilors and running our meetings. And it should be noted that the recommendation is to establish a vice president of the council, which we don't have currently. In the Roberts rules, uh, the mayor can pass the gavel to any one of the councilors. Uh, in if you refuse, then because you want to speak on the issue, because if you take the gavel, you can't speak on the issue. So before before the mayor gets the gavel back, according to Roberts rules. You have to dispose of that issue. So you don't lose, as the mayor or chair, you don't lose your right uh, actually to debate because you can pass the gap. But you can only do it, according to Robert's rules, on very, very rare occasions so as you don't uh, interrupt the, the, so the, the impartiality of the mayor or the chair, which is paramount impartiality. So, but now, I was really in, um, in support of the mayor not chairing the meetings because I don't think that, I'll be blunt, that Robert's rules are followed. I mean, Mayor Narcos has never interrupted a speaker, ever. And I think we had, I'll say it, 12 years where you were interrupted constantly. And it says in Robert's rules also that a council will not be interrupted by the chair even if the chair know, see, thinks they know more about the issue than they're talking about than the council. It says it right in Robert's Rules. So uh, I think if Robert's Rules were adhered to the way they're written, this might not come up. And I'll stop with that. Uh, I know what Richard is saying. I just want to say briefly that I'm supportive of this change. <coughs> Common sense. And no one has a problem with the establishment of the vice presidency. Okay. I'm going to support it, by the way. I meant to say that. I mean, I'm in full support of this. Okay. It's, uh, okay. Yeah, Jess. At this point, because it has to do with um, the mayor and, and what the mayor should or should not chair, we discussed the mayor chairing a big board member of the school team. Sure. Well, sure. Well, the, the, school the, board member of the, school the recommendation currently is uh, for the public's interest of the recommends that the mayor retain the chair of the, of the school. Is that, as, I, as I read the, the, uh, what the Charter Drafting Committee has, has done, which has kept the same structure the mayor presiding over and voting the school committee meetings, this is my question to the committee. It seems to me that there are some really good reasons why the mayor should preside over the school committee. 
um, for example, the structure reflects the significance of the school committee budget to the city, fifty <coughs> percent. Um, the model is, is, is reflects uh, in, it's endorsed by a majority of citizens, and it's and it's it's a common structure. Um, but I, I I'm wondering why the mayor should obtain voting rights um, when, as they, as the mayor chair of the school committee. And I also wanted to note that the vice chair of the school committee uh, was not in favor of this structure. And, and I, if, if, I know she's not present, but if we can learn a little bit more about that, possibly. Um, and and I, I, I disagree that it's an arm. Of the, that, the, that the school committee is an arm, is an arm of the executive branch. I disagree. I disagree with that statement. I don't think it is. Um, so I, I'd like to hear from from the count from the other counselors and from. Uh, members of the committee, why, why, why should there, why should the mayor have voting rights as, as a school committee member? Why should he retain that? Um, and, and that could lead to a five-five split. Um, I, I, go ahead. Well, just quickly on the five-five split, we do talk about that a lot, and uh, <laughs> there's never been a case of a tie in the history of the school committee. Uh, they try to work, you know, for pretty on a consensus basis. So there wasn't a grave concern. That that mathematical technical possibility was that was debilitating, but we did talk about that. Um, uh, but to the bigger point, uh, why should the mayor have voting rights? It's, it's a debatable point. Uh, but the committee's final determination was there's the one person in the entire structure of the city government that has the clearest mandate from the public is the mayor. Uh, and with the school committee budget as big as it is. And as, and as was debated when we had our, um, our round here with former elected officials, uh, former Mayor Higgins made this point, when the public is upset about the schools, they call the mayor. They expect the mayor to take action when the schools are involved. Um, and therefore, the mayor uh, should have the ability to act on those concerns. Uh, so that was, that was the main argument for why the mayor should retain that that authority. As far as what um, the school committee vice chair said to us at that same session, uh, I don't want to put words in her mouth and botch her argument. So I, I and it was it was uh, unfortunate that we did not get more input from the school committee. She's the only person that came to that session, and no other school committee member, school committee members came to our other sessions. So I certainly urge you to, if if you have concerns about it, to reach out to the full committee and get more input, um, as well as other parents in, uh, who are involved in school issues. Uh, but you know, she uh, she seemed to have concerns that the mayor was uh, you know shouldn't be able to put a, such a big stamp on the committee that the, that the school committee should act, be able to act more independently. To which Higgins said, "Wait a second, I'm the one that gets all the complaints. Why should I have the ability to do something about it?" So there's a, there's a difference of ideological opinion there. By that train of thought, should the mayor vote city council? I mean, I mean the mayor is, is, is certainly is the the entire city, but, but um, I guess I guess I, I think possibly it would, be, it would be a better separation of powers than there didn't vote in that committee. Well, councilors have, I don't think councilors have as much of a mandate as the mayor does, but more so than the school committee. School committee elections are rarely contested or even noted by the public. We did try to make some changes to hope to better that in the future. Um, but it's never going to reach the level of the mayor. Uh, and I don't think the school committee is, I mean, you can say it's not part of the executive branch. I don't think it's part of the legislative branch either. It's its own thing. Uh, and, you know, our, and our final determination was that the public should have a direct say uh, in the strongest possible way in that, in, that, in that body. And the best way to do this is to have the mayor have a direct role. Do you have a question? Oh, I, I had a question, um, not related to this, but maybe something that you can weigh in on. Um, council president and vice president, that relationship as far as a vacancy isn't really addressed. If for some reason the council president resigns, arrest becomes deceased, gets convicted of a felony, goes away, is there succession? Does the council vice president become president? Or does the council elect another president? And that isn't really clear in the document. And perhaps you just thought that we should deal with that in our rules or something, and you didn't want to have it in there. But it's left a little ambiguous. 
Yeah, Sometimes some of the things you want to dealt with by ordinance and some of the things we're putting in charge. Well, we're talking about order of ascendancy so we don't have Al A. Okay. Um, it's really important that you sit down with Stephen McColtrick because he can answer all of these questions and he can explain why certain things are in the charter and certain things are left to ordinance and rules. Really important, you need to spend three hours with him because he can answer a lot of these questions better. Going back to the, um, the chair of the, of the school committee, um, his, he made a comment that you know if you if, you, if the mayor is is um, is just a member, even a voting member, in most cities um, mayors won't show up to school committee meetings if they're just voting members if they're not the chair. It's perceived as sort of a um, a slight to them to just be another member. So there's some practical politics there that Stephen, with his breadth of knowledge, can answer a little bit better than. Than we as just committee members. This is uh, you're hearing a lot of things secondhand um, from Stephen. So I, to that point, uh, Stephen wasn't able to come tonight. He okay. was trying to. He has some uh, family matters to attend to. He will be available for both readings of, of this as we debate in informal sessions. So, uh, Paul's next. Um, yeah, I think the, the difference between the council and the school committee. I mean, just uh, an anecdote from my ward is. When we found out that the current person from our board was not running for the school committee, I mean, I and some other people, I, I think we called 10 people to try and get them to run. So it's serving on the school committee is, I mean, I'm really impressed that people do it, and I'm glad they do it, but it's more like serving, getting people to serve on the committee or position. There usually is not a contested race at, in the board level. There certainly was a large, and we're often having been in the board for years looking for pleased we've served. So it's just getting somebody willing to do that. It's less somebody having to debate what are the issues, what do they believe about school committee. Rather, it's just please serve. We need, we need people. <coughs> I have to agree with uh, Councilor Adams in this regard. Uh, it, it seems as though we, we have a we do have a sort of a separation between the mayor that proposes the budget and then one legislative body that uh, approves it or cuts it or what have you. Um, to put the mayor on, this, on the, the body that approves the budget, or it will like, send it on rather to the council, um, does seem to overly muddy the, what the committee is about, whether it's executive or legislative. And, um, I think the claim that it's uh, an executive body is uh, or an arm of the executive branch. I'm not really sure I agree with that. <coughs> um, so I, I'm, uh, I'm not opposed to uh, taking them, taking, making the school committee simply the school committee and not the school committee plus the mayor. Terry, did you want to speak uh, to this point? Uh, well, just a quick uh, question. That, that, that uh, well, as long as I'm up here, the opportunity. I, I want to point out that um, I thought the issue that I raised about having uh, minority views heard uh, was going to be addressed by the Charter Review Committee. So I waited until the very last minute to express my views. They raised legitimate uh, questions, criticisms, and I was only able to put together uh, a statement that addressed those criticisms. I think their statement in here doesn't, doesn't reflect that because uh, the statement that I put in clearly considers the, the objections that they had. And along, so along those lines, is there going to be another meeting or is it going to be another, the next time I speak on this is it going to be for, before the City Council for three minutes? <coughs> uh, there will be, I believe, no, we'll be trying to complete business tonight and then look at and discuss this the next time in formal session. So we, if, if you want, we will we will speak to that point. Let's clear up the school committee thing, and we'll talk about it. Your, 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 your uh, well, yeah, who did, I haven't looked over this way to make sure that you guys. Okay. No, we had our hands up. You, you did have your hands up. Well, okay. I'm sorry. So. Okay. What you put? <laughs> okay. Go. All right. Well, what, do you have something you want to say on the on the school committee issue first? So yeah. Do this I, I just wanted to say that. What Councilor Specter was talking about the difficulties of getting people running because in Ward 6 for school committee, I just have talked with um, Lisa Baskin from Ward 6, I mean, Mimic, and um, 
she was saying how difficult it was just going out and getting 50 signatures. She said, you know, her term is the proposed change is to put everyone in four years. years. Yeah. And she said when she goes out there, <coughs> people will say, well, what are you doing standing for? What, what's your position? And here she's in this position for four years, and it's taken her forever to get 50 signatures. So there is a problem. I agree with her. So it's not to Gene. I'm going to agree uh, with all of you. I'm not really convinced whether or not you need to have the school committee and the mayor. The, the, the school committee, you know, I always look at the school committee as a bunch of people that are there and their, their focus is to educate our kids. And they know that they have a dollar amount that they can deal with. And I, I sometimes uh, would sit through school committee meetings and would see school committees go to some, some brilliant ideas on different things. And, the mayor with the Sarah's bed, well, we don't have any money for that. And the whole discussion would stop, would end. But maybe it's a different mayor. You know, so that's um, people watch a, a particular mayor operate, <coughs> and then they think, well, he's, hmm. Uh, I thought that was kind of <laughs> blunt or brutal. And uh, I'm trying to tiptoe here. Um, and the, and, and the discussion would end on some pretty good programs, I thought. Um, even discussions such as closing schools, like the Florence Grammar School, things like that, busing, um, things. So anyway, I don't know. I'm not convinced that the school committee needs to have the mayor watching them every minute. I think they should have a little, a little latitude to be able to discuss things in depth amongst themselves. Are you, are you suggesting the mayor shouldn't be present at the meetings at all? <laughs> Because they the mayor should probably not chair, chair the school committee. Well, the school committee, though, as far as being administrative or executive, they have a role in negotiating contracts with their unions. And that puts them firmly in the administrative, and their administrators, and that really puts them firmly in the executive department and the mayor's expertise since the mayor is involved in negotiations with city contracts with city side employees as well I think makes the mayor's role very important with them and also lifts them above other committees in that they are directly involved in our in fact our largest union contracts I agree no. I have a strong I'm strongly in favor of the mayor continuing to chair um, and I, um, I absolutely appreciate the logic gap um, that is that you're describing, Jesse and Owen. That that, that there's that it does it, it doesn't seem to fit. But I would say in in practice and in reality, it does. And that and that having the, the mayor is the leader of our city. Um, you know, we've got there's the, the school committee. I mean, God bless them, what they do, and the hours they spend working for virtually volunteer um, volunteer time. And I feel like I want my mayor accountable to running these meetings. I want him or her on the hook. And I want, and I, and, and so I, I feel like there is so much at stake. Um, there's so much at stake in our, in our public education. It really is a defining feature of the community. And I think our elect, highest elected leader should chair that effort. So do you do you, and the retention of voting rights? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, Councilor Murphy makes a really cogent point. The, in, that is, by my reckoning, the, the distinction between a, 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 an administrative position and that. The collective bargaining, we don't, as counselors, do not participate in collective bargaining, thank God. <laughs> but the, the fact is that the school committee is charged with that. They negotiate contracts, and the mayor is the chief administrator of the contract, um, should have a say. Otherwise, the, all, the, all the associated problems that we have with collective bargaining already become even further complicated by insulating the mayor from participating and, and presiding over that. 
to the issue that Gene was talking about, I mean, it, my concern is that what you, the, the expression that, of, of chilling conversation and debate happens regardless if the mayor's president. The mayor can still say, we have no money. I may not be able to vote, but I'll tell you, we don't have any money. So that, that, that still exists as a, as, a, as a thing, regardless of whether they're chairing or not. I mean, they'd be referred to on what poll because, and, and what's significantly important, of course, is, as Jesse has pointed out, it's over 51% of the budget. It's a significant form of uh, dimension of budget. So in that respect, I mean, I think that distinction is important. The, the collective bargaining distinction makes a big difference. And, it, and it, it's, it, so to the extent that the school committee is an elected representative body, a legislative body, so in that regard, they're similar to us. And they enjoy less powers than we do. For instance, they don't get, they can advise us on this charter, but we're going to vote this charter uh, and not the school committee. But at the same time, they possess a certain power, a specific power. And I, and I think this is regardless of the fact that it's difficult to find people to sign up for this. I understand that is true. That is, but that's not an issue that we can legislate or determine in, in, uh, by, I mean, we should make every, we should make it as easy as possible for reasonable people to run for office or to represent. But the fact is we, I think we have to be careful if we're going to craft this document to try and promote people with, with an eye towards doing that and then losing sight of what it is that we're asking them to do. Not to steal the judge's idea, but uh, I thought the gradient was brilliant, by the way. It made it easy to understand. <laughs> but in the gradient, I'm in, I'm in the middle on this one. You know, I'm not, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker for me. Uh, I'm right in the middle. Uh, I think uh, I could go either way on it. But um, I just think it's a discussion that needs to be had. Clearly. Absolutely. Adam, would you want to add something you want to add to this? I wanted a related perspective on this. That it was voiced by Pat Goggins at a meeting of the Charter Drafting Committee back in December. It was He was concerned that the mayor chairing the school committee interferes with the power and leadership of the superintendent. And he felt it was a factor in turnover <laughs> in that position in recent years. So I, just wanted to make sure that was represented. Well, case in point, some of the turnover had nothing to do with the mayor. And yeah. Some of it had to do yeah. with the law. That that was just his it's perspective. Just, I just okay. wanted to convey. And, and again, <laughs> and I think I, I, I take your point. Yeah. Yeah. Pamela, do you have something to say? I just want to say that I, I think that if we don't have a functional mayor superintendent relationship, then we're in trouble as a community. I, I mean, I, so I, I think that there's. There's, so to me, I'm not persuaded by that. I feel like we need to make, we need to do every, whether or not he's on the school committee or not, there need, there, everything, in our, we need to do everything in our power to hope that, and I realize it's limited because there's so many factors at work in a relationship, but that I will just say that the collaboration is critical to getting the job done. I just want to make a minor point it's an address to Gene when you said you could go either way here to all of us. That if you, it's kind of like six of one, half dozen of another, I would encourage us to therefore yield to what the Charter Committee, and there's a reason for that. As a member of the Appointments Committee, here we had a lot of people spending a lot of time working on this. So if you're kind of in the middle, I would take their recommendation and say, wow, these folks debated this for a long time, and this is what they came up with. Again, if you're against it, I'm not encouraging you to go for something you're against, but if you're in the middle, I would take that into consideration as well. Sure, you are. To Councilor Inspector's point, I would be liberally in favor of the committee. Yes. <laughs> well, well, thank you. So, I, I think we beat that one up. Yeah. So, can I, can I talk about the charter objection? The right of um, yeah, do you mind if, uh, if we, because we did open with, we addressed what Adam Cohen had presented and we have not addressed what, what uh, Barry is presented and I think in fairness. Yeah, but, okay. Uh, that's great. I just think that, uh, I'll just say, I'll, do, I'll fold what he said into this, my comments well, what, on charter why, why don't you do that then? Yeah. <clears throat> I believe that what Mr. Roth and the language of the charter objection um, should, should, should generally not be the charter. Uh, I think there should be, there could and should be some uh, modified language that talks about the rights of a minority counselor. 
uh, the rights of a minority counselor to put in uh, language that's a contrary proposal to an ordinance or order, uh, and uh, possibly to object, but I think it should be worked out mostly in the council rules. Page 10, uh, 29C, the charter objection, I think it's way too specific. Uh, again, I think there might be some value in having a minority right, but I think that it shouldn't be uh, so spelled out uh, in, this, in this document. The, oh, back to, just back to the comment on the superintendent. Um, to remind everybody, the school committee members and the mayor are elected. The superintendent is employed by them, is their employee, and, and answers to them, and that's one of the contracts they negotiated with their superintendent. So to have that, have that individual be a resource to the body and on the same page they're on is very important, but they're not the same, they don't have the same status. And, and I think another reason the mayor, it is important that the mayor is there and invested in that 100%, is that the mayor, and it still stays the same, determines the total dollar amount that goes to the school department. So the mayor says, here's how much money you've got, and that's the most powerful thing that happens to them. Mayor says, "Here's what you got." So I think it's very important that the mayor is completely involved in that and their activities and the way that money is spent. Because we might approve the budget and say that's what they're getting, but the, the distribution of that money is the purview of the school committee. We can't affect that. We have our joint meeting, but essentially, they give us their budget, and that's their business. The, the, the joint meeting is kind of for show, for us to understand their budget. But we have. Don't vote on it. We don't control it. The mayor says, here's how much money you get, and then they distribute it. So having the mayor involved from that point through, I think, is very important. Back to the uh, charter objection. We may have a minority reconsideration already in our city council rules, and that throughout the years has been changed and modified and narrowed a bit. And, um, and if we were to include this sort of provision in our, in our charter, be much more difficult to, to change and modify, um, of course. So I agree. That I think that it would it should either be it should be um, if, if left in the charter, uh, left open for it to be modified uh, by council rules, as, as council Freeman did suggest. Um, and I, Barry and I have spoken about this. It feels like years now, actually, Barry, at some level. And, and, um, and actually, I think the incentive and the spirit of this is appropriate and correct. I, and what I, have, what I have offered to Barry here are other alternatives to, to trying to get to the same goal. Hang on a second, then you'll get a chance to you'll certainly get a chance to. Um, one of the ways, of course, is uh, making comprehensive minutes of every deliberative point and every deliberative facet of, of any legislation that, or ordinance or resolution that passes through, through the council and that by having a video document that can be referenced by any citizen, by any, any counselor, to understand not only the bullet points of an argument, but the, the actual the, the temperament of the and the, and the, and the true disposition of the argument. And, and to some degree, I would argue that that would even be more uh, it would speak more to the point uh, of what you're suggesting. The, the big, in one of the things that we were concerned with, and I know that the, the draft committee was concerned with as well, was who ultimately becomes the arbiter to decide, and as we know, there's no two points or two arguments to any issue. There's multiple faceted points for every person who feels compelled to speak out on the issue. And who becomes, who is assigned as the arbiter to distill those as bullet points on ordinance or projected behind the council when the issue is being delivered. And, and, and also to what Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels saying and also uh, Councilor Adams, that making it a condition of the charter is, is the language is too fine and restrictive in that it it doesn't allow for something more nuanced that we could develop through our rules. It doesn't disqualify it as being possible. And, and in fact, I believe the, the intent that you're describing actually uh, lives within all of us, actually. We have the same, 
probably not with the same level of vehemence, perhaps, as you, but the fact is that that is our, that's our bent, that's our inclination, is to increase and expand public discourse and to get opposing viewpoints and to have and understand the spectrum of, of opinions related to an issue, particularly the public investment of the issue. I think we can draft and work with these outside the purview of the charter. And the specificity assigned to the charter rings a little off compared to everything else that we're talking about, which is pretty rudimentary. And then uh, at the same time, we we have within our power to put into effect something that will, I hope, I believe, that will achieve the things that you're, you're, you're aiming And if you want to comment on that, I, I, I recognize Mary uh, in first oh, because she thinks up. Well, sorry, he had his hand up too, and I thought we were speaking to him. There we go. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Anyways, um, I did attend the last meeting with the charter, the drafting charter committee, and brought forth <coughs> and read off what Barry Roth had suggested. And I also told them that I had a monthly meeting with Barry Roth and also our city clerk, Wendy Mazda, and also Eugene. Casey, and it all occurred very well. You were gone away on vacation that last meeting. And I explained to them of our concerns in Wendy's office, okay? And we put together exactly what you actually were looking for, okay? They kind of like understood it much better than the way it was presented before. But there is a problem here. Um, I really feel myself that it belongs in our council rules. <clears throat> I don't think this really should go into the charter. Once that's in the charter, you can't make any kind of changes anywhere from that. In the council rules, we can make all the kinds of changes. Say you wanted to make something even stronger, we'd be able to change that one. But I know talking with our, our city clerk, she also felt too she had a problem with it about putting it on the council rules. So I just wanted to let you know that. And they told me that was their recommendation that night when I went there, was because they felt that it should go to the council rules. I think you want to talk about it. Thanks, Marianne, for uh, filling in. I, I just got back from the those who don't know. Um, here, here, I, I know I heard from uh, Councillor Owen Daniel Freeman who told me that uh, that's what we have a republic for. We have a republic because everybody knows the ordinary citizens really just don't get it all. They don't have access to all the information. That's what a republic is, in case you don't, in case oh, you don't realize it. Those were the arguments made for republic. And you said so as much tonight when you said uh, a minority viewpoint of the council should be heard. Well, I got news for you guys. You live in a different world, most of you on the city council, from where most of the citizens in this country and in this city live in. The very fact that you're able to be on a city council puts you in a position that is way different from what the average person is in this community and in the country. When we rely on you to express our viewpoints, very often you simply don't hear it. That's why you've got the Tea Party movement on the right, and that's why you've got the sit-ins on the left. You don't get it, frankly. What this is asking for couldn't be more simple. It says very simply, if a person has an objection, it gets put into a packet for consideration by the council. Right now, the way the committees work, all that gets pushed up is the viewpoint of the people pushing that committee or that subject. If you have an objection, it should be heard. Everybody has a right to be heard. Going for three minutes before the city council and expressing your opinion is a joke. And it isn't recorded. It isn't heard. To go to the extreme of taking all these minutes and everything else, that's not going to happen. 
What this says very simply is, and it, this is what it says, is if a person has an objection, it gets put into the committee notes that are passed to the city council for consideration. How you express that before you take your vote, that should be in the com committee rules and regulations. Whether you want to come up with some means of getting a summary position, that's fine. Do that in rules and regulations. We're in agreement on that. But what this puts into the charter is a statement that minority views, even if it's a minority of one, will be heard and put on the record. And there is no excuse for not doing that. Um, yes, Mary. Uh, go ahead. Where would the problem be by putting it on the council rolls? Can you accept? Sure, can you sure, that? sure. The problem is that just as within the city charter, the mayor has a right, if the, if the mayor vetoes a bill, she has the right to record her objections and it goes in to the, into the record. Well, why is it necessary to put it in there for the mayor? The mayor has executive ability. She gets to choose the people who sit on the committees, who draft these laws, uh, uh, these proposed legislation. She has the ability to veto this law. She has the ability to vote as a citizen. She has the ability to express her opinion. The mayor has all these options. It stands to reason that a citizen should at least have the right to, to have their opinion recorded. And if the, if the city charter finds it necessary for them to, to put in, in writing that the mayor shall have her opinion recorded, then it's no different for an ordinary citizen. The city charter should say, a record should be made of this citizen's objection. It doesn't put any onus on any committee or anyone to write it up. It's up to the citizen to write up an objection if they have one. And, and, and oh, just along those lines, Mary, one other thing is that uh, you get to speak before the city council. And that's because it's in the charter here. Otherwise, any day, you could take away that right to, be, to speak before the city, city council. So it's, 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 it's tantamount to those two things. And it is absolutely beyond my, uh, beyond my understanding why there is any question about it. Well, yes. Um, yeah. Have Eric Bell you know, we spent a lot of the time with our city clerk. And she explaining about the language of it, she also did not have a problem with it going into the charter, correct? Yes. Now, Wendy, how do you feel about this then? I mean, when I first talked to Barry, I said, well, it appeared that it was a, uh, this should go to the council rules. And he made his case. And <clears throat> with much discussion with him, asking him how this was going to play out with the city council, um, you know, I felt that He's right, there's no difference. I mean, a, an ordinary citizen should be able to, if there's an ordinance, a zoning ordinance, not everybody's able to uh, attend their hearings. <coughs> an ordinary citizen should be able to put their opinion before the city council. I mean, have it attached as part of their document. And so the council is able to look at the pros and cons of before they make their decision. I mean, and that was all that he was looking for. So I didn't feel that that was any extra work for anyone other than the citizen sending in their particular letter uh, saying why they were opposed to this particular zone, let's say, I'm using zoning, a zoning ordinance, and then getting that as part of your deliberation, okay, you have it in front of you, you see that this person is against it, and however you choose to, however you choose to, um, you know, talk, if you choose to talk about it, or you have this particular information in front of you, it's not going to change how, it may change how you vote, it may not, but at least it's part of the record. How is, how is that different from that? And so far as that any letter submitted to the council is, is included in our packets? It's any, any objections sent to the council are included in our packets and part of our deliberation. They, uh, and the council contact appointments in nature of representative government I, and, and, and Barry, I, I, I'm still confused as to why a comprehensive record of debate and discussion and deliberation process is some form of obfuscation. 
how you how you conceive of that as being coming up weaker than say a bullet point of an objection that would be included in some specific generic document as opposed to a letter, for instance, submitted by you if you weren't able to attend a meeting or if somebody wasn't able to be present. And I and I'm trying I'm seriously trying to suss out what the distinction is here that 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 you find we come up lacking in because by the way, I think your your interpretation of how we affect government here is off. I think that you are I understand I understand your, your frustration, but I think what you perceive as what's happening is that, that that and I'm not sure but it sounds like you're describing essentially councils going with a, an aspect of naivete showing up to the meetings and then basically being and I think you've expressed this to me before we're being swayed by more powerful interests and not considering uh, alternative viewpoints when there's been lots of opportunity for alternative viewpoints to be presented. And I understand if that's your perception, I can certainly understand then consequently your frustration. But if we have comprehensive minutes, and I mean comprehensive minutes, and, and by the way, I would hold up as case in point, Barry Roth is standing up here tonight yelling at us in frustration and expressing his concern and anger and has done so a number of times throughout the charter review, throughout before council meeting, and it's not having it written in black and white in some form by some arbiter is not going to change how your arguments are perceived or someone of a minority's arguments are perceived or understood. And, 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 and that's, I, that's the distinction I'm struggling to get here. I guess the distinction is rather subtle, so I'll, I'll, I will draw that out. Very simply, most people do not have time to go to all the committee meetings. When something ultimately comes before city council, it's because somebody has something they want to get legislated, an ordinance, or they want something. So it goes into a committee. So at that, at that point in time, it's the people who have an agenda of some sort, and they, who initiate that, that meeting. It's put in the papers, it's put on the computer. But it's a long time before something is drafted that uh, an outside citizen has time to react to. I know in my particular case, uh, it had to do with an environmental law in my community. Uh, by the time I found out about it, uh, by getting a card in the mail that there was going to be a hearing about it, it was, already, it was already a done deal. I was told very specifically by the sponsors of it, look, this has already been discussed over a long period of time. It's not going to be changed. And I found when I spoke, it had absolutely zero effect. It was as if you talk about yelling or speaking or whatever. Trust me, I'd rather be at the beach. Uh, this is not something that I'm doing because I, I enjoy doing it. The fact of the matter is it wasn't recorded. It wasn't recognized. And, and had it been very subtle, Changes could have compromises could have been reached. I wasn't opposed, per se, to this legislation. If 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 there was something something keeping the door ajar slightly, to to really hear and not just not just be speaking before the committee, then a compromise could have been reached. A better solution could could have been reached. But the process was room. I hear, I hear uh, Paul Spector tonight, oh, the Charter Committee, they went over this for a long time, blah, 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 blah. who are we to really give, uh, to give a hard time on this? That was the same thing, uh, argument he gave to me about the, uh, about the environmental laws. If, if there is an opportunity, what I want is on record. Anybody can come at the very last minute, and, and the Charter says that it needs to be heard. It just says that it needs to be heard. Then in rules and regulations, it can be debated about it. But when you pass a law with this in the charter, it says, anybody, anybody can turn to it and say, look, I presented this. They had to look at it. They still voted this way. And therefore, it forces, it, 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 it makes you stand on your position. When I stated my positions against the environmental uh, turn back, which I don't want to overblow it because it, my friends and counselors who, who were for it. I was not heard. And, and even though I had, order, I had a guest column in the paper, but if you were to go look at the notes and the votes, it was as if 
variance, if I may, and I'm going to allow some of the council to address the direct process here. I mean, I don't disagree with you, Barry. I disagree with something you just said, which is I think I, I could almost rest my case. I think there was a huge amount of work that went into this, where citizens were invited multiple times to come. And for what I did not say is we should not have, if you don't have an opinion, I very clearly stated that, as Jean said, to give it a liberal reading, if you're in the middle okay. on this. And I so that, that misrepresented, but you misrepresented a few things. So I want you to understand one thing. I think just in the last few days, one of the things that happens is whenever a letter comes to the, to the council clerk, it comes to, let me finish, comes to the council clerk. You talked about listening. I heard you. I could probably repeat what you said. Please, stop so the lecture, finish. please. Well, body language says a lot, Barry. So when a count, when an email comes to the council clerk, we all get that. Anybody who wants to send that, and we read those things. I know that sometimes you can be frustrated because you can make an argument, you feel you're right, and you know what? You're heard, but you're not agreed with. And I think there's a big difference. When you also misrepresented how the, co the committee process works. I've served on many committees for eight years here. I have seen counselors turn the rest of the committee around when the mayor or someone else has wanted something, and in that committee meeting, one counselor or two say no. And so I disagree that it's just been a rubber stamp, which is what you were implying. But I do agree with your basic statement. I do think it should, I just don't think it should be in the charter, but I do agree with what you're saying. I think it should be written, I think it should be part of the council rules. Um, Owen, from the Daniels, I'll panel on the council to go. Well, I, I just, I just, I just want to figure out what we're doing here process-wise. That's really what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with it being in the council rules. I'm not compelled to put it in the charter. I, I, I feel like we've heard you, and I feel like we, we are in the process of responding to you. This is one forum. There's going to be other opportunities to talk to each other, uh, to, our, to us individually, back, continue back and forth, but I'm just conscious that I know we have to be out of the room at 9, and I, and I feel like I do feel like for this increment, we've given this issue its due, and I just want to make sure that there are other issues we should. <coughs> and I'll you have yeah, I, I just want to make a few comments. Um, Mr. Roth also addressed me directly, but uh, you know, those are between public emails, so you know, that's a matter of public record. It seems to me that part of what you're saying, Mr. Roth, is you want an even cheaper version of the free petition. In, in a sense, the petition of one. Um, so if the council is not in favor of the free petition, then they wouldn't be in favor of this. And I also want to talk about a couple other issues because I brought up the charter objection. And I, I do believe that there should be a right of a councilor in the charter for a minority opinion. That's what you put in, in constitutive documents minority rights. You don't rely on the, the body to determine its own minority rights. You put it in the charter and the, or the, you know, the constitution and the, the body works on the, on the specific rules. So I do believe that there should be something like the charter objection uh, in the charter. And I also, I'm not opposed to Mr. Ross's idea that um, a counselor could have the right to put in a notwithstanding clause in an order or ordinance. Um, so, you know, when you read it, you say, whereas X, Y, Z, whereas X, Y, Z, notwithstanding A, B, C, which might be that counselor's objections to the issue. Mr. Roth does not believe that goes far enough, as he and I disagree, I guess, over the nature of what Republic means. But uh, that's those that I, I brought this up specifically because I think there should be rights of a minority counselor in Section 2.9. It is apropos to what Mr. Roth is talking about, but it shouldn't be as specific as it is elaborated here. Um, Marianne. Could we have somebody from the committee to come forth about various um, statements that he wants to place in the charter and let them talk about their decision and why they decided to do it and do it in the council? I just have to point out that between Owen and, and, and Paul, uh, Owen's saying that I'm asking for a petition of one, and Paul is saying, well, it's, the petition of one is already in the system, so. Oh, thank you. Uh, do someone from the draft committee know? I think Judge Perlman, Chair Steve. <laughs> Did that gradient. 
Yes, you did. Um, I guess I, if, if my uh, fellow members of the committee don't agree with me, they can, they can uh, come up and yell at you all. So, um, it's always going rogue. <laughs> um, I think we, we really just want to stand on the things that we've already said in our narrative to you because we've considered um, Mr. Roth's issues at uh, some length and uh, included them in the report. Is that what you were asking for, a response on, on these issues? And I, I just think, again, I'm thinking about your time with 20 minutes left, and this is a this is a subject that's been very thoroughly discussed, both by us and now by you. So whatever you see in our narrative, that's how we felt about the situation. Thank you so much. It, um, sort of this issue, and it's come up before me, because often a committee's recommendation <coughs> will come to council before its minutes do. And I know it's always been very helpful to me to know what the committee's deliberations were like prior to making that recommendation. And often, we'll get the recommendation and we'll be asked to vote on first reading. We haven't seen the minutes yet because they just haven't been processed. I think, and council rule is definitely the place for this, to perhaps tie action on something to the arrival of its minutes so that those of us that weren't on the subcommittee can actually see what their deliberations were, see if the public came and commented, and have all of that in place, and that might go some distance to solving Mr. Ross' problem, and also helping us understand what happened behind the recommendation. To that point, uh, once, we, once we survive the uh, charter review, we will start to convene uh, open public workshops where the public's invited to participate, a uh, discussion about council rules committees and, uh, and commissions. And and this conversation will be continued there as well. Um, and now, I know we're going to lose Pamela. Yeah, we have 15 minutes left to discuss the rest of the chart. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Gene, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I have a small thing. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I really have not, uh, when the city council relies on home recommendation for its voting, it shall accept an opposing statement for review prior to its vote when and if a different position exists. The composition shall state in writing the specific reasons for this approval. The city council shall enter the objections as part of the record in the same manner they enter the recommendations prior to voting. I just have to say, I think it's pretty simple to attach an opposing viewpoint and move it from committee to council. And so, um, I really didn't, I don't have any, I didn't have any problem with it at all. It's the way it's chartered, but I will say there are six rules and things on the back, specifics, mm -hmm. that I don't think should go off would go into the charter, which could go into council rules. <coughs> that particular paragraph, I didn't have any problem with it at all going to the charter. I kind of I kind of support it, and I still do. I have a sense that actually there was consensus to that, ex to that extent the spirit of what was being suggested here. I got the sense that there's consensus is how it how it is realized and where it's realized in, in our rules or in the charter is the point of the thing. And that's something we'll get to hack out of the floor. Uh, or maybe we we'll I'd like to see that one paragraph go in, into the charter and then some of this can be hacked up into rules. Yeah, we did, yes. Yeah. And like I said, I spent a lovely time with Barry Roth and with Wendy. She said either which way, it didn't make a difference to her. Just talking with her again now, she said the same thing. She, it really didn't bother her which way it went. Um, I, I'm looking at of how much time we spent with him and making an agreement, okay, of how that procedure would be done, which Councillor Casey just talked about, is that each time I went to a committee, right, then it would be brought to City Council of what, before we get our packets, say we get our packets on a Friday, that objection would be attached to that. It would give us counselors the opportunity to call that person and talk to them about that objection. So, I'll, either which way, I'll put it on the charter or put it on the council rules. But I really feel the council rules has some strong authority with that, too. The, uh, Sorry. Hey, Pamela, thank you for your time. Um, Gene, do you have uh, some other questions? Yeah, about just, it's about the minority part, and to Councillor Owen Freeman Daniels. Uh, a councillor should have 
the opportunity in anything, even in appointments or whatever it is, to be able to voice their opinion there. If they have an objection, if you have one counselor that votes against something, even in the in the context of appointments, they should be allowed to discuss it and not just say, no, it's my appointment. It's set up for discussion. And if if Mayor LaBarge what? is not going to re run, run again for re-election and she has an appointment that she is going to make, it's a five-year appointment for City Solicitor Adams. You're getting it tonight. But uh -oh. just should that happen, an outgoing mayor who has a couple of months left be allowed to make a five-year reappointment long before the appointment, the reappointment is due, before this last appointment has run out. If two-year mayor, that means the next three mayors will deal with it. So, so that's well, not a minority. Actually, I think you can ask that of the city solicitor Polio. <coughs> That point, in fact, you serve with the pleasure of the mayor. Or, I mean, at least using that as an example, that, that, that the mayor could say, "See, I don't like it." Yeah, well, yeah. can do whatever they want. We well, can and we can, yeah, we can. And we can. So that's what. I, so that's what I'm getting at. You know, yeah. um, and if somebody doesn't agree with a, an appointment or a reappointment, it's like the governor. But, but can I ask a question? You can, if, if an appointment has come forward, that you know, we most of them we come forward with recommendations from our committee. If, have you ever felt you couldn't say at the council meeting to object to it and say Absolutely. I don't agree with this? That you couldn't with the reappointment of a department head. But, but when I, no, reappointment of a department head. Yeah. Well that's that's what I'm getting at. The reappointment of a department head. Yeah. You, so you're I'm not trying, talking about I'm committees. To oh, I'm sorry. So you're not talking about committees. You're no. talking about mayors hires that the yes. mayor's doing. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a different but Gene, then if the mayor is only there for two years and the hire is for five years, would you say that mayor shouldn't be allowed to appoint it because the well, person's no. going to be there twice as long as the mayor? No, no, no. But appointment long before the previous appointment is over. And should it be discussed or not? Should there be a discussion? Should uh, there be some okay. conversation? Sorry, okay. Would you think there should be or not? Yeah, I, I actually think there should be. I'm not... I, Okay. How does that uh, relate to so what's I'm in the charter? Trying to figure this out how to, where this would go in here. I, w I would suggest that that actually doesn't go in the charter. It goes in the council rules. And then, in fact, it would be a dimension of the council rules. It's also putting I mean, where you are talking about the separation problems. And we're talking about the administrative and executive office. And the fact is, if, you know, by the way, not to be too snide, but if you had a two-year mayoral term, you have run a higher risk of the scenario that you just described. <laughs> but uh, the, with a four-year term, you know, that's less likely. But in, in any instance, actually, these are hires. There may be contractual hires, but they're not sacrosanct and not protected by the hiring. So that there is the possibility of a mayor who finds that they don't think that this is the best candidate for a variety of reasons, as if the, they serve with the pleasure of the mayor. And can be fired as such. So, and and again, I don't know. And I think to your point, I don't know. If you put that in the language of the charter, more so than that's a discussion for us to have as we decide what the rules of, of governance would be. I'm not trying to take the appointment away from the mayor, but I would like to have the discussion. I'd like to have the conversation. If somebody has an opposing viewpoint, not just say. No, you either vote yes or no, and we don't want to hear it. Well, I believe that if you're voting yes or no, and every vote, yeah, yes or no vote, there's a debate. And the discussion, it's not done. It's when not I tried to debate through. it, the mayor said, she shut me right off, and she says, it's not open for debate. It's my appointment. Well, let me and, she says, and, we, and she says, we will not entertain debate on it. Well, let me reiterate something here. First of all, we're not talking about any her or him mayor here. We're talking about the charter that, as I said, will be serving people that don't even exist today. Okay. And that, that will be presiding over people who don't exist today. We'll have so, some discussion later. Okay. Um, 
in now we've got 10 minutes left to talk to the rest of the charter. And is there, were there any other issues, Gene, or anybody? I just going. going. So in, in keeping with the last minute idea that I've had in the last minute, the last few minutes of this meeting, um, I have been interested in having potentially a public safety commission, which involves, um, which could involve some administrative oversight by counselors. Uh, or by a committee that is not the mayor of certain bodies in the, uh, yeah, in the city, certain uh, departments in the city. Uh, and I think that basically a few cosmetic changes to the charter, striking a sentence here and there, would allow for a commission. I don't want to put the commission in the charter. I don't think it belongs. I don't think any sort of thing that could be created by ordinance belongs in the charter. But in order to create such a commission, you could not do it if, if a couple of sentences, section 6.1, section 2.3b, they're in there, you really can't have one. So I, I just would recommend that we take them out. Uh, and then if, in the future, if the community or the council feels that there needs to be some administrative oversight of the just the mayors about certain departments, they could do it by ordinance and the charter wouldn't. Uh, could that be the question? Um, can we address that when I was about to say? Steve and Bolt. That would be a good question for Steve to see what, what we need to do. Because I would certainly agree with you. We want to leave the option open. Um, I, I think that's what you're saying. Yes, that's it. That's it. Yes, yes. So I would agree with that. I'd like to ask him what we, why could we, what, what are any downsides if we have, what would we need to strike exactly in order to have that happen? If someone's against it, I can bring it up so that. Yeah. And, it, and I have to apologize to the Charter Redrafting Committee because I kind of kept this to myself until until uh, very recently. It, 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 it should be noted it's, <laughs> it's a significant change if, if, if we were to vote on that now or we'll vote on it next week, the Establishment Police Commission. So I, I appreciate your point that allowing the language to to at least allow it because it, this it's, it is a, it's a distinct change in the separation of the, the assignment powers, and that would be huge. And clearly having a debate about this with this timeline at this late point would be challenging, but I think, I, yeah. I appreciate you. And, I, and, and if you could, if you could uh, isolate the sentences that you and the recommendations of right. the language I'm not the, I'm not the consultant, but yes, I could. Right, but that's something that we can submit to Steve in advance of the meeting of the councilman. That would be appreciated. Um, G. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to say thank you. I mean, uh, it was a tremendous amount of work. And uh, I think uh, if we only, only picked about three or four different items and it took us three hours, uh, there really was not a lot to be debated in here. I think it was excellent. Thank you very much. It was uh, a lot of work. Thank you. I, I'd like to reiterate not only the my thanks and gratitude to the committee that's voted all this time and energy to it, but even more particularly a group that's never that hasn't been recognized adequately enough, and that's the public that actually contributed to the conversation. And I say and I speak to you directly as well, Barry and Adam, that 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 this is a document that's not just for us, it's a document for the city. And the fact that there was community members willing to devote the time and energy to come to sit on hard chairs in, in usually underheated or overheated rooms to talk about prosaic language in, a, in a, an antique document it speaks to the fact that there, there are community members here who are vested in, in the pulse of the city. And I appreciate that more than anything. I, I certainly appreciate the, the citizens who gave up their nights because they were appointed. <laughs> And the, and the time and energy and the, and the very thoughtful deliberation that they, they submitted, but also, more specifically, the citizens who invested their time and care and their concern in, in this deliberative process. And it continues. When we convene again on council chambers, uh, we will be discussing this and debating this on the floor. Uh, Barry Roth's right, there will only be for public contribution at that point, it will be in public session for the, the allotted time. But the fact is, access to us doesn't start and end at a council meeting. 
you my email is bdwight at comcast.net or wdwight at northamptonmod.gov. We all have emails. I'm the only one with a city email. <laughs> but we all, we're, we're accessible. Our numbers are in the book. We, any thoughts that anyone continues to have on this, you submit mail, email, phone call, stop us on the street. Tell us what you think because we, we don't, I, I, despite some of some of the suggestions to the contrary, we we truly value every every aspect of input. We are representative government. That's at least that's what we all are. So thank you all very much uh, for your participation in this. And we'll see you Thursday night if not soon.